The hour of 1245 having arrived and passed, uh, the Santa Cruz City Council will come to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Colin Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Present. <laughs> and Mayor Keeley? Lord. Uh, I'm also here. <laughs> Madam Vice Mayor, welcome. Thank you for uh, showing up. I appreciate that. Uh, we are on uh, public comment regarding our closed session. We have a couple of items on closed session today. This would be the opportunity for anyone who's with us in chambers or online who would like to comment on the items on our closed session. This is your opportunity to do so. Let me ask if there's anyone with us in chambers today wishes to do that. Seeing and hearing none. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Nobody online, no. We do not. What we are doing now is we will adjourn to our closed session, take up a couple of items. We will be back, I suspect, 45 minutes or so from now. We stand adjourned in a closed session. Recording stop. The clock's not ticking, so where is it? Where's the clock? Thank you. <laughs> um, In the in the um, under the the precept or the intention of clarifying language and cleaning it up, things were changed in the um, downtown plan, and um, the outcome of rearranging those things is that not only Zone B, where the hotel, the luxury hotel, is to be was zoned for additional height, but the entire Pacific Avenue on both sides, all of zone A was also rezoned for higher heights. And the way this happened, I, I was left with the impression that city council actually and Mayor Keeley did not understand what they were actually voting on. Council member Watkins said, I approve Excuse me, height. excuse me for just a moment. In zone B. Um, you can make any oral communication you want. Um, I would ask you to refrain from trying to interpret what was in council members' minds. So why don't you state what your opinion is? Thank you. So this, um, it gives an impression that either this council did not understand what they're actually voting on, but in the minutes of today's meeting that you are about to approve, it very clearly states that zone A was uh, increased as well as zone B. And if this council approves those minutes without taking out part H, you will leave the public with the impression that you are complicit in this obscure way of rezoning more than was allowed for public comment. And that does not create trust with the public, it creates um, concern. Thank you. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Certainly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. You know that my name is Rhonda Reyna, and I'm an impacted mother who has experienced domestic violence and abuse. And I'd like to point out that the $251 million campaign that abuse, um, there's no excuse for domestic abuse, is ineffective and wasteful of taxpayer money. And I wanted to congratulate all of you, especially you, Council Member Sandy Brown, that you guys are now all famous once again, and so is Officer, now Sergeant Ruben Badeo, seen here abusing a domestic violence victim in opposition and complete oxymoron to how victims of domestic violence are supposed to be treated. The Santa Cruz PD's walking around with these bumper stickers and passing this stuff out. And the new documentary features the kidnapping of Maya and Sebastian Lang, and we can see Ruben Badeo in there participating and facilitating their violent kidnapping. All of you have seen the video of my daughter's violent kidnapping. And um, I just want to say that we need to cease this program because it's ineffective. 
I really don't understand how you get up every day in the morning and look in the mirror when you've allowed this to happen and you've basically given this cop a hall pass when George Floyd, who was allegedly murdered by Derek Chauvin and you've got spray paint outside marking Black Lives Matter when he was strangled in front of the public nationwide. I want to know why this didn't make local news when the whole world knows about this. All media outside of this community, which again, Santa Cruz is featured in this documentary. There's lots of pretty pictures. And it feels like we're Satan Cruz, not Santa Cruz. Are you guys embarrassed? I mean, what's the city manager doing? Do you have the power to terminate him and hire someone new? who's going to hire honest police officers and terminate abusive men who, that man nearly killed my daughter. That's homicide. Thank you. Anyone else online? We'll take the next person online, then we'll hear from you. We're going to alternate back and forth. Thank you. Person online, good afternoon. Okay, thank you. This is Derek. Hey, last meeting detailed grant application proposal called uh, Preserving and Promoting Housing Affordability and Climate Resilience strangely or purposely, was not included in the council packet when you blindly approved it. The vague item's brief summary lacked real discussion or questions, had no presentation. I wonder if you even read it. It turns out the grant application contains serious but vague commitments to the state. One of your many promised deliverables to the state was a long-term affordable housing climate resili resiliency funding stream, either by ballot measure or at budget expense, Spent according to an, an as yet undefined fund governance document, uh, among other vague contractual promises. The grant purpose does not require such a commitment. The details missing commitments to the so-called decarbonization roadmaps, funding price-controlled housing development, inclusion of unelected regional bodies, corporations, and lavishly compensated CVOs being compensated to what value exactly? Thought for their one-sided input where no property owners spoke where you pay climate tenant activists big bucks, calling them stakeholders, paying people 175 each to get engaged. Well, it's all sneaky leftist socialist Trojan horsery. Sure, everybody prefers a cheaper whatever. Many, including cultural Marxists, along with those who think they will benefit at no personal cost, are okay with this free market usurped price-controlled housing. Even less people favor the further bribing of otherwise elected developers with public asset subsidies of public land and density bonuses, but when the public themselves sees the manipulation of what eventually becomes a coercive forcing of them to fund other unknown others' housing indefinitely without even absolute assurances that always goes to the most deserving and then they're not here illegally on support, hidden in a Betty System infrastructure grant package is probably not going to go over as well as you think with the public. Uh, no matter how many expensive manipulative PSYOP workshops you hold, the CBO bribes, <laughs> language, justice, and equity is smeared all over it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Good afternoon. Thank you. I apologize for my shaky voice. I'm not great at public speaking, but today I come to speak for those who cannot. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, thank you for this opportunity to address you today. I stand before you with a heavy heart, having witnessed unimaginable suffering that compels us to act urgently. Today, I bring to your attention the dire situation faced by the people of Gaza. This morning, I bore witness to 30 premature babies huddled together surrounded by a makeshift wall of aluminum foil desperate to retain any warmth, as all fuel for the incubators at Al Shifa Hospital has been denied. Thousands are held hosp hostage in this hospital, subject to gunfire, even the slightest movement by Israeli drones. I've seen fathers carrying the remains of their children in grocery bags, crying out to their God for solace their babies deemed blessed martyrs. Mother's wails echo over the shattered remains of homes and children. Countless children bloodied and missing limbs are rushed into hospitals, their cries of pain and confusion piercing the air. In the rubble, children scream for parents who will never come. All of this is funded by our US tax dollars. As a mother and a human being, my heart and mind will never forget what I've seen and learned, and I ask the Palestinian people for forgiveness that it took 11,000 of their loved ones, 50% being children, to be murdered in order for me to wake up. And even now as I speak, untold numbers remain under the rubble. What will it take for the rest of the world to wake up? In 2020, our community rallied for Black Lives Matter. I saw our city protect the words painted on the street outside as it was desecrated each time. I witnessed hundreds march our streets and the police stations stormed. 
Every year our city supports and protects LGBT individuals and we proudly pro proclaim ourselves a sanctuary city for immigrants and we honor indigenous people of this land. In supporting the Palestinian cause to the people of Gaza, we affirm our commitment to justice, equality, and the fundamental right to live free from oppression. I implore the council to take a public stance in favor of the Palestinian people and to our U.S. government can you spend billions of dollars towards this genocide, this act of genocide before our eyes? Take a stance, a public stance to our state representatives so that the world and the Palestinian people hear our voices there when theirs cannot be. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online, then we'll be with you. Person online, good afternoon. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, council. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I guess I guess there's got to be hundreds of people maybe watching us. Uh, I uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the high density development in downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, I don't have a specific problem with a specific building. Uh, I have a general problem with a general pattern. Uh, so the Sentinel, the Sentinel, this is Brad Snyder, by the way. Uh, that was uh, evident uh, to Bonnie, but not necessarily council. Um, I uh, the uh, <laughs> The, uh, the pace and pattern, uh, you know, which you're building, I, I mean, I don't think there's a single um, uh, large city where that, that amount of high-density development looks normal um, in, in Santa Cruz and in Santa Cruz County. I just don't feel like the economy can support it. I feel like the people working at those construction sites uh, might have a chance to rent uh, one of those units for, say, half a year at what they're priced uh, and that's, that sounds sarcastic. I, I'm sorry. But, yeah, I, I really do feel like uh, the pattern is like the, the Sentinel, that that um, that paragon, that, that pillar of uh, journalistic integrity, you know, they'll, they'll put out this kind of tantalizing article about a new development that, you know, everybody, um, you know, de facto is uh, in support of. And and then and then it, it gets uh, um, fast tracked. You know, and so there's just more and more development. And I, I feel at some point you have to put the brakes on it to say, like, look, enough is, is enough. You have a, a thousand cubicles for people to live in and they're all overpriced. So only half of them are going to be uh, dwellings. I mean, that's that's my cynical. That's a little bit cynical, but I, I do feel that there's a certain accuracy to what I'm saying. OK, I have 17 seconds. So um, I hope everyone had a good Halloween and happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to indicate the sign back there, safety and freedom for all children. Um, I know this is, um, we kind of organized this last minute, there's not much of us, but you know there's been a lot of protests calling for a ceasefire. Um, and that's what we want. We want freedom, safety for all children, Israelis and Palestinians. And um, you know how with the bombing, with the bombing that Israel's been doing, that so many children have already died, so many people have already died and so many more will continue to die. And this is all again with US government support. Um, so we would call on you to pass a resolution calling for a ceasefire. It's been done in Richmond, as we know, and um, we can be second or third. Other city councils are trying to do that. It's, and that, as I think my friend mentioned, we could, that would help to support Jimmy Panetta and Biden in also doing the right thing and calling for a ceasefire. You may, it may seem that they we're far away from this, but I think if a lot of city councils called for ceasefire, that would really help our leaders do the right thing. Um, so many more children are going to die, but there's so many civilians so densely packed in Gaza. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have both said for years, and the UN, that it's a grave humanitarian crisis, that it's an open-air prison. We could go on about that, but right now we're just talking about a ceasefire. It's really important we get it done now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Wish? Okay, anyone else wish to address us on oral communication? Seeing and hearing none, we will move on to item three. This is an arts and economic prosperity study results. Ms. Lipscomb, good afternoon. Good after, afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development and Housing. And with me today is Jim Brown, Executive Director of Arts Council Santa Cruz County. And um, I know you all know Jim. Um, he's definitely a leader in our community. And he's going to um, 
give an overview of the arts and economic prosperity survey results. But first, I just wanted to set the stage and talk about our sort of contributions and the importance of art in our community um, from the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we've long recognized the power of the arts in contributing to the health and well-being in our community. And this goes all the way back to the tannery and the closure of the tannery and the investment of the city to remediate that site, which did have contamination, and to turn that into a thriving arts community. And that's actually where um, the uh, Arts Council is today, as their home as one of our anchor tenants. Um, we do provide ongoing sustaining and grant funding to the Arts Council every year um, for art projects throughout our community, as well as they play a pivotal role in helping us um, be a leadership on the Tannery Arts Center campus as well. So from uh, programming to being a council um, and city liaison to marketing and communications within the tannery. Um, we also support the arts um, through our own Percent for Art program at the city and um, have a very vibrant um, and very active arts commission. And Jim actually presented last week to our arts commission the same study. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jim and uh, he will give you the overview of the survey results. Thank you, Ms. Lipson. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor <laughs> Keeley and council members. Thank you, Bonnie, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, just wanted to orient you to the handouts I handed out. Uh, there is a, a um, infographic that covers the uh, the county of Santa Cruz. So those numbers are county oriented, and then the the stapled sheets are uh, are basically a summary of all the three each arts and economic prosperity studies that we did across the county. Um, just want to say a huge thank you to the city for supporting this study. It's important work, and especially to Kathy Mintz, whose, uh, whose support and council has been super helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So for those, those of you who are less familiar with the Arts Council, we see ourselves as the mycelial network of the arts ecosystem. We mostly work behind the scenes to keep our arts ecosystem connected, well-resourced, and vibrant. The primary point of this study is to show that the arts are not just a nice thing to have. They aren't a luxury to invest in when we have enough resources to do so. They're an, they're an essential resource that makes our communities more livable, defines a sense of place, and improves community cohesion. It, and they generate significant economic impact. This report, conceived by and managed by Americans for the Arts and conducted by over 300 partner organizations across the, uh, across the country, uh, seeks to quantify that economic impact. Next slide. In the city of Santa Cruz, the nonprofit sector, uh, the nonprofit arts sector generates about $38 million in economic activity. This includes direct spending by arts, arts organizations on salaries, supplies, venue rental, and taxes. Uh, it also includes audience spending uh, when they go out to eat or to buy a, uh, buy a drink when they go to an event or to pay for fuel to travel, a hotel stay, um, or to hire childcare. It doesn't include any of the for-profit uh, arts activities, so that's things like the Catalyst or Artisans Gallery. Uh, all of this arts and economic uh, impact generate 981 jobs in the city of Santa Cruz, and that includes jobs for artists, but also jobs for arts administrators, waiters, store clerks, babysitters, and hoteliers. The study estimates that the arts and culture uh, sector generates about $2 million in ta local tax revenue, which of course goes back to councils like yours to invest in infrastructure that supports a healthy community. $8 million of the $38 million is audience spending, uh, and uh, this spending is over and above the ticket price on things like those drinks out. Next slide, please. As Bonnie mentioned, the city of Santa Cruz invests directly in the arts. Uh, in at fiscal year 23, they, uh, you invested $330,000 in the arts uh, through various programs listed on the slide. Um, I think of this investment as seed capital that organizations like the Arts Council and other uh, nonprofit organizations across the city um, use to generate tens of millions of dollars in economic activity. The, the modest investment that you make is multiplied 115 times. Next slide, please. We did separate studies, as you see in your, in your sheets, uh, for the county of Santa Cruz, for the city of Santa Cruz, and for the city of Watsonville. The bar on the left shows the full economic impact of the entire county. 
Um, next to that, you'll see that over 50% of the economic impact of the arts is generated in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, Watsonville is about 13%, and the remaining areas of the county are about 30%. The data is somewhat skewed. Uh, the impact of organizations like the Arts Council that are headquartered in Santa Cruz is counted in Santa Cruz. So, uh, and we do work countywide. So there's a little bit of a skew, but the disparity is clear. Historically, there has been less investment in the arts in Watsonville. With increased investment underway through the Arts Council, as well as the city of Watsonville's percent for the arts program, which is new to them just in the past year, we hope to see that disparity shrink but regardless, civic investment in the arts pays off many fold in ways both, both measurable and immeasurable. Next slide. This chart compares Santa Cruz city audience spending with regions across the country of similar populations. You'll notice that Santa Cruz uh, spending is about average compared to the regions shown. Uh, but when you consider the high cost of doing business and living in the central coast of California, these numbers start to feel a little bit on the low side. Uh, based on this data and the data that we have for the county for the countywide work, we think there's a real opportunity to partner with organizations like Business Santa Cruz and with hoteliers to drive more arts and cultural tourism in the area and increase that in that that um, visitor spending. Last slide. So. Thank you to the city of Santa Cruz for, uh, for your decades of investment in the arts. Uh, with all the changes underway in the city, I encourage you to always look for ways to increase investment in the arts so that the city retains its vibrance, creativity, and sense of place. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Brown, thank you for your thoughtful and helpful presentation. Let me ask if there are council members who have questions and comments on this item. I will say this. Um, I'm, I'm going to use this as a carom shot. Uh, I love what you do, and Thank I you. think this is part of the beating heart of the city of Santa Cruz, our local economy. I think it is one of the aspects that makes us so attract, magnetically attractive to people, whether they're locating here in the city of Santa Cruz to reside here, to do business, whatever it may be. And in that regard, here comes the carom shot. Uh, I think this is really quite important to emphasize as we are considering uh, the expansion of our downtown area. I happen to believe that most people are going to experience that downtown expansion not by living there, some small, relatively small number, but during the period of time that expansion takes place and is there, millions of people are going to experience that downtown expansion area. And for me, for all the talk of units and stories, what most people are going to experience is being on ground level. What is it we're doing in that ground level that is artic artistic, provides an entertaining artistic experience for people, whether or not they live there? Ninety something percent of the people who are going to experience down, are now expanded downtown are going to experience it that way. So I'm going to thank you for letting me preach on your dime <laughs> about this. I but completely I think agree you with are, you. Are, you are critically important to that happening. Thank you for your presentation and allowing me to tag on to it. You are critical as well. Questions or comments. Thank you so much. Okay, thank Good you. work. We're on item four. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring November 25th as Small Business Saturday. I'm going to defer to Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have the honor of presenting this mayoral proclamation, and I am going to go ahead and read it. There's a lot of juicy stuff in here. <laughs> Whereas, since its inception in 2010, Small Business Saturday, falling between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, has illuminated the significance of supporting small, independently owned businesses across the country. And whereas Small businesses, Business Saturday is a day dedicated to supporting the diverse range of local businesses that help create jobs, boost the economy, and keep communities thriving across the country. Whereas the city of Santa Cruz celebrates our small businesses and the contributions that they make to our local economy and community. And whereas small businesses rely on the holiday shopping season for much of their revenue and the support of local shoppers to their businesses each year to survive. And whereas 85% of Santa Cruz businesses are small businesses employing nine people or less, I'm going to repeat that, 85%, mm -hmm. 
Um, whereas there are over 500 retail businesses in Santa Cruz providing nearly 4,800 jobs. And whereas purchasing goods and services from local small businesses keeps those dollars local and contributes to a more vibrant and sustainable economy. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz encourages all residents and visitors to shop and dine locally and to recognize the impact that we can make when we support local small businesses. And whereas businesses across the country will be celebrating Small Business Saturday and encouraging shoppers to shop local. On behalf of our mayor, Fred Keeley, um, we hereby proclaim Saturday, November 25th, 2023 as Small Business Saturday in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join us in shopping local today and throughout the year. So I see Bonnie's here. Ms. Lipsham, good afternoon again. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, we are a proud supporter of Small Business Saturday, and it does fall, as Council Member um, Kalantari Johnson mentioned, two days after Thanksgiving this year on Saturday. And it's a great time to support our local businesses, whether they're in the downtown, the midtown, west side, Mission Street, throughout the city, to kick off your holiday shopping. Um, this is uh, the critical period, really, of the whole year for our small local businesses. So we really um, encourage you know, our, our community to get out and shop um, on, on Saturday. Um, as in past years, we are supporting Small Business Saturday and participating with the Downtown Association to provide a unique and fun downtown shopping experience. And uh, Rebecca Unit, our economic development manager, um, is just going to pass out a, a few of our um, Choose Santa Cruz bags that we'll uh, be donating to um, the Downtown Association as part of that promotional event um, and some of our latest um, very colorful um, sunglasses. <laughs> Thanks again for supporting Small Business Thank you Saturday. so much, Ms. Lipscomb, for your work and the work of your team. Um, I know what I'll be doing after I digested my Thanksgiving meal. So thank you. Come present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. I have to make a quick comment here and say that the, the sunglasses in your swag bag are wonderful. Really? I gave mine away. I uh, got a pair, and I gave them away. So... Um, just yes, I'm so stoked. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, the only correction I'd like to make is as you were dividing the city up, uh, you mentioned something called Midtown, which is a manufactured idea, and, and didn't mention East Side. We have West Side and East Side. Anything else is made up. So thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. Um, and for those of you that have ever mentioned East Side in the last 11 months here, or Midtown, recognize that any time you say Midtown, I'm going to go on this rant. So thank you very much. All right, being an East Side resident, who some people allege I live in Midtown, there is no such place. Uh, number five, we are on Friends. The library is going to present a check, which we always love. Uh, for the Brants of 40 and Garfield Park Libraries, Mr. Howard, Ms. O'Driscoll, and Mr. Cotter. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor, and thank, thank you, you, Council. Good afternoon. My name is Janice O'Driscoll. I'm the current president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. This is Eric Howard, who is the interim library director. <laughs> The Friends of the Library are advocates for good and excellent library service. That runs all the way from being sure that we have good store times for preschool children, a place for people to go when they need to research to establish a new business, and a chance to do homework, whether you're a fourth grader or you're in college. We're also fundraisers, mm -hmm. and we fundraise for programs that make it possible for teenagers to come to the library to write poetry. We make it possible for people in the community to come to the library at noon to hear classical music. <laughs> and we do capital campaigns, you may have heard. Since the establishment and the passage of Measure 
S in 2016, the Friends and their chapters have raised well over $3 million for the, for the renovation, for the establishment of new branches. Over the next few months, you will see the opening of a new Aptos branch library, and you will see the establishment of the Live Oak Annex. There's one more capital campaign to come for the downtown branch library, which serves as both a local branch for the city of Santa Cruz and the hub for all the branches in the system and outreach services. But today, we're here to celebrate Garfield Park and Branciforti Branch Libraries. Branciforti, by the way, on the east side. <laughs> and our last major capital campaign was in 2020, an eventful year. We didn't know uh, what was going to happen when COVID exploded. We didn't know how we were gonna talk to people when we were all in lockdown. And yet, we managed to raise over $1 million to support the Garfield Park, the Branch of 40, and the Aptos branches. The Garfield Park and Branch of 40 campaigns were beautifully run by Martha Dexter. Martha and her committee and the generous donors who responded to her committee's work made it possible to honor Martha's mother, who was a longtime resident of the Garfield Park area and a, a very loyal library user. And we were also able to honor the public work of Mike Rotkin who worked very hard when Garfield Park was threatened with closure. He galvanized the community so that would not happen. At the Brent 40 Branch Library, the family, the friends, and the colleagues of Allison Endert mm. were able to establish a memorial children's room, a beautiful new open children's room to honor Allison and the importance she had in our community. So when people look at libraries, they see books, they see computers. We see people. We see the library staff who makes everything work. We see a local government who makes it possible for those libraries to exist. We see the voters who always support the libraries when they come to the ballot box in this community. Mm -hmm. We see the generous individuals and businesses who shared the resources so we can have 10 amazing contemporary public libraries in this county. And we see the people who need these libraries, who needed to find a job, to do their homework, to learn to read, to find a good book, to have a community gathering space so they can attack some of the problems and issues in the community. But what we have here is a check with a lot of lovely numbers on it. And when you look at those numbers, I encourage you to see the people who made those numbers possible and necessary. And on behalf of those people, we would like to present you with this check for $461,000.
I, I just want to say, uh, many of you know that Janice was in my position before she retired. So she's gone from working six days a week to working seven days a week <laughs> as a volunteer. So we are eternally grateful for her passion and wisdom. Ms. O'Driscoll and others, thank you so much for what you do every day. I am of the view that public libraries are secular cathedrals. This is how we keep reason and observable facts at the front of our minds in the world. And uh, God love you and thank you for what you do every day to keep that going. It's critically important. It's not a, it, it is an essential critical element to the democracy, not some optional thing out on the edges. It's one of the cores of our democracy as an informed public. And thank you for what you do every day to help make that happen, make the, the democracy stronger and better because of it. Thank you all so much. Let me ask, I suspect there may be other comments here. No folks, okay. I, no, we're all good. Thank you, thank you very, very much. All right. Uh, don't feel compelled to stay one more second if you don't want to. <laughs> we, pleasure, we appreciate your politeness. Uh, we are on presiding uh, officer announcements. I'm going to refer to Ms. Bruner uh, for an announcement. Ms. Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, Bonnie Bush, thank you. I'm sharing a flyer here on the screen. November 13th through the 20th is United Against Hate Week. United Against Hate Week was created by a group of civic leaders in direct response to the sharp rise in expressions of hate in our communities. And Santa Cruz County United for Safe and Inclusive Communities uh, wants to empower local residents to take action in our communities and alter the course of this growing intolerance. When we come together to work against hate, we can restore respect and civil discourse, embrace the strength of diversity and build inclusive and equitable communities for all. And as you all know, a couple of years ago, this council declared racism a public health crisis. We've uh, written a racial equity resolution. We're really working on various uh, racial and social justice issues in, in this body and in our city, and we want to support all residents in our city. So I encourage anyone who's interested to attend any of these free events. One of our partners is the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and the entire list of events is on the Santa Cruz Public Libraries website. So I encourage you to go there. I also want to share that it is simultaneously the week of Transgender Awareness Week. Transgender Awareness Week is a national, nationally recognized week to um, you know, recognize and bring action to trans community by educating the public about transgender people, sharing stories, experiences, and advancing advocacy around issues of prejudice discrimination and violence that affect the transgender community. So with that, the last event of United Against Hate Week will end with a um, Transgender Day of Remembrance vigil, which will be held in Santa Cruz. So I encourage everyone to check out the list of items and thank you for allowing the time to share. Thank you, Council Member. We are on item number, uh, excuse me, we're on statement of disqualifications. Any member have a disqualifying? We're good. Additions and deletions, city managers recognize. I'll actually defer to the city clerk. City clerk. Thank you. Um, yes, item 19, which is the ordinance requiring delivery companies to provide a service enabling customers to tip delivery drivers is pulled and continued to the um, next meeting, which is November 28th. November 28th meeting. 
Yeah, and if I may Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, myself, Council Member Watkins, and Council Member Bruner, who are the subcommittee working on this, um, have received communication from industry representatives. So we are um, wanting to continue this to the November 28th to give us additional time to do further legal analysis and address industry concerns. Thank you very much. Such will be the order. Uh, City Attorney, any report out of closed session, sir? Yes, thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. The City Council met this afternoon at 12.45 p.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. There were two items of business before the Council. Item one was liability claims. Uh, the two claimants are Barbara Jean Lawrence and Zita Morrow. Uh, those claims are also listed for action this afternoon as item 12 on your consent agenda. There were also item two, uh, significant exposure to litigation. There were two matters that were uh, on the agenda. Council conferred with legal counsel. There was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. On the meeting calendar, um, no changes. No. no changes on the meeting calendar. Thank you. We are on the consent agenda. These are, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we will be taking up items 7 through 16 inclusive on one motion. Uh, this is uh, going to be the opportunity for council members. <coughs> I'm going to start with the council members to see if you wish to pull an item, comment on an item, or have questions on an item. I'll start on my left. Uh, Ms. Bruner. Ms. Condar Johnson, Ms. Bruner, I'm sorry, did I go to? We had an item in oral communications which referenced an item on our agenda. So oral communications is supposed to be not on our agenda, right? But there was a speaker who spoke to the minutes about the minutes, and there was a question in the minutes. So I just wanted to see if at some point that could be addressed and it sounded like it was maybe a um, planning uh, question and I'll look I'm looking at city manager uh, yes council member Bruner um, we will have staff reach out to um, to the member of the public that raised the questions regarding the minutes and the council's approvals of that item thank you so much good Ms. Collin, Jones. madam vice mayor is recognized I just have a comment on eight mm -hmm. do you want me to make Go it ahead. now Okay, I just wanted to comment that the budget hearing that's scheduled for May 29th is the last week for Santa Cruz City Schools, and that Wednesday, typically, there's promotion ceremonies for middle school mm -hmm. and elementary school that might affect staff or council members' inability to attend. We might consider changing that date. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Thank you for that comment. Further comment? Ms. Brown, recognize. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is just a, a quick comment on uh, item 16, which is striping improvements um, at San Lorenzo Boulevard. Uh, and I just wanted to thank the public works staff, the public works department, and the Transportation and Public Works Commission for uh, your work to ensure that uh, these kind of safety improvements, uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety, ADA compliance are built into that project and just in general appreciate how Public Works is, is moving forward with bike and uh, ped infrastructure improvements as repaving is done, as, as broader work is done. Um, it's just uh, really great to see it happening um, and so I wanted to call it out here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Newsom, anything? Okay, seeing here none, uh, no remaining items. Let me go out to the public, see if there's anyone who wishes to make a comment. You can do so on any and all items up to three minutes. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, Charlie Eady. I uh, wasn't gonna say anything today, but I'm here on behalf of item 13, 118 order on circle. That's a a, a beautiful example of what's called mid-century modern rustic by uh, Joe Eshrick, who was a, a marvelous architect and founded the firm Eshrick, Holmesy, Dodge, and Davis, which is in San Francisco and designed many of the buildings at UCSC. So they have a big um, presence in this town. So we're happy to see that. But more importantly, I wanted to... Uh, Congratulate Mayor Keeley for ranting against the term Midtown. 
<laughs> and I hope you keep it up. Thank you. Well, now I have two people. Okay, this is good. Mr. Eady, while you're, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Eady, for your years of service to our community in the area of economic development. Thank you for all the fine work you've done over the years, sir. You're especially brilliant about geography. Um, let me ask if anyone else who is with us wishes to comment on the consent agenda. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. Motion would be in order. I move consent. Motion by uh, council member Watkins. Is there a second? Second, I'll second. by council member Newsom. Debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Torrey Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 17. Excuse me for one moment. Give me one second on this. We're on item 17. And this, these are amendments to Title 18 and the Municipal Code. We have a range of issues here, including greenhouse gas emissions and so on. Uh, we will be receiving a staff presentation from Dr. Wise West, uh, and there will be associated planning department comments as well. Dr. Wise West, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, I am here today uh, with John McLucas, the senior plans examiner from the planning department. Good afternoon, I sir. also want to introduce uh, Farhad Faramond and Taylor Taylor from TRC. Um, who have been supporting us on this effort. I also just want to acknowledge that Clara Stanger, who co-wrote the agenda report with me, is out on maternity leave, so she is not here today. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, just to uh, refresh you. I'm sorry, the clerk has to make a setting before I can share the screen. Okay, here we are. Thank you. So um, it's just some policy background on why we're bringing this item uh, to council. First of all, um, uh, resolution NS30-042, um, adopted a community-wide goal of carbon neutrality by 2035 and a legal target of a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030 from 1990 levels. That was part of the adoption of our Climate Action Plan in September of last year. Also uh, adopted in uh, 2020 was Ordinance 2020-06, which was our natural gas prohibition in new construction, requiring all new buildings to be all electric with limited exceptions, which we've been implementing successfully uh, since uh, 2020. Um, I'm not going to be getting into, we've because we have done so extensively, kind of the how and why, but I'll say a couple things about this. Number one, uh, this is a major greenhouse gas emissions reduction measure that's called out in our climate action plan. It also has the co-benefits of increased public safety by reducing the number of fires in buildings. Um, as well as an improvement to indoor air quality. Why electrification? Well, electric is 50% renewable energy right now. By 2030, it'll be 100% renewable energy. And so that will allow us to take down these natural gas peaker plants that are emitting so much greenhouse gas emissions. Just a little bit of background. So with respect to our natural gas ban, we have to talk about the Ninth Circuit ruling. So um, the California Restaurant Association uh, sued the city of Berkeley, and it's been going through um, a, a lawsuit. Um, essentially, uh, a recent ruling found that California's all, or I'm sorry, Berkeley's all electric new buildings ordinance, which is very similar to our natural gas prohibition, was actually preempted by the Federal Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975, or EPCA, and therefore was invalid. However, they did not issue a stay or injunction, and Berkeley continues to implement their natural gas ban um, to this day. Um, 
also, uh, we then, uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, brought to you Resolution NS30, 156 in June, which temporarily suspended the enforcement of our prohibition in of natural gas infrastructure in new buildings. I do want to mention that there were over 1,200 units that came through permitting as all electric during that three-year time period, which is substantial for us um, in terms of greenhouse gas reductions that we really need in order to meet the target that I mentioned, the legal target. <clears throat> so we needed an alternative approach, and we indicated such in June when we came. We know that um, the Berkeley versus CRA, California Restaurant Association, is not likely to be resolved in a timely manner, so we can't wait for that. We also know there are no imminent statewide fixes for this issue, despite a lot of lobbying and advocacy going on at the state level. And in fact, the city, city has already started to receive mixed fuel building permit applications. Um, again, where uh, we are concerned about the greenhouse gas emissions from those, um, those buildings. So um, our, our proposed alternative is really to adopt an increased building energy performance requirement as an amendment to the California Energy Code. And this is called a REACH Code. You'll hear me uh, reference this. Um, it is performance-based. Um, and because uh, the Berkeley suit does limit how we can regulate emissions, um, and because the California Energy Code expressly allows uh, local amendments, so long as they are uh, consistent with state law and federal law and are cost effective. Um, this approach that I'm going to share with you now has already been adopted by San Luis Obispo and the city of San Jose, and there are at least two to three other jurisdictions that are looking at putting this in place um, as well. So uh, just a little bit of basics so that when we get into uh, the proposal, uh, you the proposed ordinance, um, you will be fluent in what we're talking about. Um, so the California Energy Code does allow uh, reducing emissions by regulating energy demand caused by buildings, so the performance. As I mentioned, the REACH Code refers to the local amendments. Um, to the energy standards that, again, cost-effectively reduce energy from new buildings, again, in compliance with state and federal law. And lastly, source energy, which is the, the piece that we are uh, looking to regulate here, it represents the underlying fuel sources, such as coal, gas, or solar, that's used to power buildings and systems. So let's get into the meat of it. Okay, so move around this zoom here. Okay, so what you see on the screen here, you can see is called the energy design rating. And for every new building, um, a designer will have to um, input all of the various components of the building to determine the energy design rating and whether the building is in compliance with the energy code. So as you can see, there is a line that calls the standard design, so the standard design that meets the um, energy code, and the proposed design would be the design that whomever is bringing forward a, a new building um, would put in play, would, uh, would run that model for. And on the right-hand side where you can see these red boxes are what's called the compliance margins. And the compliance margins are the difference between the standard design and the proposed design. There are three components to this energy design rating, source energy, or EDR1, the efficiency EDR, or EDR2 efficiency, and total EDR, which is EDR total. So if we look at the compliance margin for source energy, which is what we'll be regulating, this, however, is, is just an example under the current code you can see that 29.7 minus 26.7 is a three. And that means because the um, proposed design exceeds the standard design, so there's a positive number in this row with the, with the red um, box here, that means that it meets compliance with the energy code, and that's what this pass uh, indicates here. So that's what we're gonna be looking at here. I wanna make really clear that this ordinance only applies to new buildings. It does not apply to renovations, remodels, um, 
uh, or additions. Okay, so here's the proposed reach code then. <clears throat> so this is a, another example of what, what you just saw, uh, the report for the EDR that's run by a designer that's required to be submitted uh, with their permit um, application. And you can see that for this hypothetical proposed design um, that the difference between the source energy of the standard design and the proposed design is 9.1. For single family homes, we want a compliance margin of at least nine under this ordinance. So this proposed design, because it has a source energy score of 9.1, would exceed the source energy compliance margin of nine. And so it would be in compliance. So you can see here, we are only talking about source energy. We are not talking about efficiency EDR or total EDR. So these are what the proposed standards look like. And I'm gonna walk you through each of these building types and show a couple examples of how compliance can be achieved with various component configurations. So. For single family, I've already mentioned that the EDR1 or the source energy must uh, be at least nine points. For the other types of buildings, this is on a percentage basis, not a points basis. For multifamily low uh, rise, you must exceed the standard source energy requirement by 10%. For high rise, by 4%. For non-residential buildings, 7%. And we have an additional requirement, which is an electric ready requirement for non-res and multifamily residential buildings with central water heating. And that is to illustrate reserved physical space and ventilation paths for future all electric equipment and ensure that the panel and transformer have capacity for such. Now I wanna walk you through this um, in several examples. So this first example is for a single family building and you can see under a standard design, so meeting the, uh, the energy code as it is right now, um, that can pass with this type of a configuration of appliances and components. Um, you see there's a heat pump, electric heat pump water heater, LED lighting, an efficient building envelope, still has a mixed fuel gas furnace, and rooftop solar panels are required here. So this would meet um, a standard design. However, for the REACH code, if this should be adopted, um, in order to achieve a source energy score of over nine points, we would need to swap out the uh, gas furnace with a heat pump HVAC unit. And that would get uh, compliance with the ordinance. I'll give you a second example. So going back to the standard design, where we have the heat pump water heater, LED lighting, building envelope, gas furnace and rooftop solar. Applicants can retain a mixed fuel building. So you see the gas furnace stays, but instead they would need to, um, to uh, install a battery storage system. And that would enable them to score above a nine on their compliance margin and would meet the ordinance. So two, at least two different uh, compliance pathways and there are others. For a low rise multifamily, um, again, for the standard uh, design building, that's, that's a zero because that's what we're comparing to. Um, for, there are two, at least two ways uh, to reach compliance um, for a low rise multifamily building, which again is meeting that, that 10% um, above the standard design. Number one, we can add a heat pump HVAC unit. That gets us there. Or applicants can retain a mixed fuel building, keep the gas furnace, add more efficiency, whether that's to the building envelope or otherwise, add some additional storage and a battery system, and they can exceed that 10% compliance margin. For high rise, very similar. Um, in the first example, adding the uh, heat pump HVAC will get you to a 7% increase uh, in the compliance. And in the second example, you could keep your gas furnace, uh, so keep the mixed fuel, add some efficiency and additional solar, and get to um, 
that 4%. I think that's supposed to be 7% that maybe didn't get changed. Oh, no, this one's four. Great. Yes, sorry about that. Um, and I do want to mention that, um, you know, in terms of, and this is a question we've got um, during some of our engagement, is what are you expecting to come through as far as buildings are concerned? And we know that there are going to be very few single family and much more of the, um, the multifamily and the uh, non-residential, so just on scale. Okay, and here is our last one. This one is a non-residential building. Again, the compliance EDR must be greater than seven. Um, and again, you can add a heat, heat pump HVAC and reach the seven. Another pathway is to keep the gas furnace, add efficiency and additional solar, and you will exceed that 7%. And there are other combinations as to how these compliance margins can be reached. So with that, Cost effectiveness is another criteria. The California Energy Commission will not approve, the, which is a next step for us, is to get approval from the Energy Commission. They will not approve this ordinance without being able to demonstrate that it is cost effective. Um, the city has uh, evaluated this, and the uh, California Energy Codes and Standards Statewide Utility Program does develop cost effectiveness studies that demonstrate this. And we find um, that the proposed amendment that we're bringing forward today is more efficient than the base code and is cost effective on a time dependent evaluation basis, which is a composite measure of the actual cost of energy for each electricity, natural gas, propane um, uh, appliance or equipment to the utility customers and society at large over 30 years. So uh, another question that we've gotten quite a bit of um, is, you know, what about, what about um, rebates and so forth? Um, Generally, all electric buildings are cheaper to build than natural gas. You're not running the natural gas line. Um, and there are substantial resources available both for new construction and for existing buildings, which we are not covering today, but I think it's worth mentioning because I know some people are interested in that. Um, I've listed on the screen here, and I'm not going to repeat all these, um, but there are substantial rebates. This will be on our website shortly if it's not already today. And we know that with the Inflation Reduction Act, there will be a lot more uh, coming that will be passed through the state. I also want to note that the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments is also standing up at the beginning of next year what's called a local renewable energy network uh, funded by the public, uh, the IOUs and PG&E specifically. And there will be more rebates and technical assistance and other kinds of supportive um, actions coming forward. And AMBAG will be managing that uh, REN, it's called, is the acronym. So in terms of engagement, I think you all know that throughout 2019 to 2020 for our natural gas prohibition, we, um, we completed extensive engagement on this topic. And then again, also, um, with our climate action plan adoption uh, through 2021 and 2022. Last year, uh, we continued to conduct engagement as we were gearing up to tackle existing buildings this year. We, of course, have been sidetracked by this. Um, but in support of this specific REACH code, we did uh, conduct a developer's roundtable with uh, developers, architects, engineers, design professionals, and property owners. We also got great feedback from our Community Climate Action Task Force, and uh, we also took this to the Planning Commission for feedback, although it, it was not a requirement. So our next steps today um, are uh, the following. The first hearing of the ordinance, obviously, is today. The second hearing, should it be uh, passed, would be November 28th. We anticipate two to three months to receive approval from the California Energy Commission, and we propose that this would go into effect uh, March 1st um, of 2024. And of course, if the Berkeley uh, ruling is vacated, we would go back to our natural gas prohibition because that is the strongest greenhouse gas emissions reduction ordinance between the two of them. Um, I just wanna finally state that we can't meet our legal target for our climate action plan without having an ordinance in place that replaces our natural gas prohibition. And so it's important for us to adopt this 
or something as strong or similar to it um, as robust in, in the near future. So uh, our recommendation then is as stated in the agenda report, and we are happy to take any questions that you might have um, on this ordinance. Thank you very much, Dr. Weiswest. Uh, let me begin by asking if council members do in fact have questions. Around here, council member Brown is recognized. Really a, a kind of curiosity uh, in terms of the, I think they're the, the EDS percentages. Um, what, uh, how do, what do we, to what do we attribute the difference in the percentages? Like why are, um, Buildings with more stories have a lower percentage. I'm just trying to, I think I have an idea, but I want to make sure I understand that. I think I'm going to defer to um, Farhad from TRC. He can give, I think, the most simple uh, explanation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Council. My name is Farhad Farhad with TRC. We're in an environmental engineering consultancy. Thank you so much for spending the time on this item today. Um, the different percentages are based on the cost effectiveness analysis that Dr. Wise West mentioned. Um, they vary based on packages, and it's just dependent on what the energy code requires for a typical building versus what uh, was found to be cost-effective through the studies. Thank you. I was just trying to figure out if it, the scale of buildings and things like that mattered, but I think I, I, think I get it now. Thank you. For the questions or comments, the vice mayor is recognized. Several questions. Thank you for taking my questions over over the weekend too. I appreciate it. Um, so my first question is of I think in the staff report it said a thousand, but you said twelve hundred today. Of the units that have been submitted since twenty twenty, after the Ninth Circuit decision, were any of those resubmitted and put natural gas? And if so, do you know? I don't know the answer to that question. And do you think it was to save money on the? Sorry, do you know hang, on, hang on just a moment. So I heard you, but I'm not sure the record heard you. Just a handful of those types. Resubmitted. And do you know why? Okay. Um, because then, then I follow up to that is that it said um, that the study would determine that it's cheaper not to have gas, but I was wondering how they determined it would be cheaper. Like what would be the reason it's cheaper to build without natural gas? Well, as I mentioned, the, one of the reasons is you don't have to run the natural gas infrastructure to the house and within the house. Um, beyond that, I think it, it's dependent on, you know, the, the building type and the type of appliances. I don't know if uh, John or Farhad have anything to add to that. Yes, that's true for single family homes and multifamily buildings with central water heaters. There is actually an upfront cost uh, for that, but the studies find that, that over the lifetime of these buildings, 30 years, it does turn out to be cost effective, so beneficial for the tenants. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of questions because I leave, received a lot of correspondence from um, developers and from um, electricians, architects, designers, and Title 24 energy consultants over the weekend. So, so m one of the developers, I guess essentially like said the opposite of that, that it was significantly more expensive to build with all electric with the upfront costs, but that it makes sense what you're saying. So you're saying over the lifetime of the building, it would, the cost would be, and that's if we have the projected same energy costs, right? Like, cause they do fluctuate. Studies do include some escalation rates based on near term economic forecasts, okay. but longer than five years, it gets really difficult. Okay. Um, the, the, I'm just wondering too, I did see um, the, the meeting that you had for October 23. Um, in October 23, you said, I saw 14 people were there. Were, were those the industry professionals or were those members of the public? They were industry professionals, designers, developers, uh, okay. engineers. Did you have pg e as any part of that? Because this is another question. No, we did not. But uh, pg e did come to our natural gas prohibition uh, ordinance uh, hearing in support. So they are supportive of electrification. Got it. Um, so the question I have is then asking pg e if um, 
if they have any plans to expedite how long it would take once your rooftop solar is installed to like when you can actually start operating your system because right now people are reporting back to me it takes nine to 12 months and I found that to be my experience as well. Where you're still- For the interconnection right. to happen? Yeah, is that about what they expect or what they think we'd be able to start expediting that? I'm gonna defer to the one of these two on that because I'm not in the day to day. I do know that there was something that just came through um, the state legislature that would compel uh, PG&E and other IOUs to uh, be more expeditious in their uh, the panel. I'm sorry, the transformer upgrades, and I'm not sure if that extends to the PV interconnection as well. But I, I want to turn to my colleagues on that. I, I believe the issue is around interconnections in general, regardless of a mixed fuel versus an all-electric building. So um, I, do, I do believe there are some longer turnaround times uh, with pg and &E currently, uh, but that's not necessarily an issue uh, related to this ordinance in particular. But it would, yes. Well, I mean, I think it would just delay, because if you can't operate, then it would it delay construction costs if you can't turn your power back on, right? Like it would just be sitting there. That's correct, yeah. But right. for example, a mixed fuel home would have a 200 amp panel and a, you know, 10 PV panels on the roof. Yeah. Uh, while an all electric building would have a same 200 amp panel and maybe, well actually it code just requires the same 10, 10 panels. So it's not actually changing the number of panels or the connection size for a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot home as an example. But um, did, excuse ahead. me, go ahead. No, you go ahead. But to be clear, the interconnection is both for gas and electric. So in new construction, irrespective if you have a mixed fuel or an all electric building, you're still facing the same interconnection time. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. No, excuse me. Let me explain how this works here. No, I don't, I, I'm gonna explain it to everybody. So if you wanna make a comment, there'll be an opportunity and I'll recognize you at the podium. Glad to do that. Back to you. Sorry. Uh, again, I'm talking about the uh, interconnection of the building. Uh, there may be some additional time with a transformer. We just don't know. But interconnection in general um, is delayed with PG&E right now. And, 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 and just so the public understands, it doesn't matter if we're with Central Coast Community Electric, PG&E has to ultimately do that, right? That's correct. OK. Um, and then the other question that I have is, um, uh, can we ensure that, and this I guess goes back to PG&E, if we were to go fully electric, I mean, I get those alerts saying flex the power, like that we will be able to not overpower the grid if we're turning off gas appliances and going all electric. Does, I know the state wants to go there, but if we went there ahead by enacting a reach code instead of kind of going with the flow in this, the state, we'd be okay? Well, just to be clear, this allows mixed fuel buildings. So there is a choice. So this isn't an all electric requirement. This ordinance is not. It does allow mixed fuels. Um, but I, I think you're speaking to things like public safety power shutoffs and so on. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that modern, uh, uh, stoves, for example, for uh, modern water heaters, they require an electric um, uh, ignition. Um, so you wouldn't be able to use those uh, anyway. Um, also, it's unsafe to operate those without an exhaust fan. So there's some more kind of, I think, context to that question. But again, this ordinance is not requiring all electric, unlike our natural gas prohibition. Um, it does allow mixed fuels. Whole day, but I have one more question. Of the buildings that have been submitted that are all electric, how many points over standard, I forgot the, the exact term, how many points over standard were the typical projects and like, um, and then how were those amended per performance points determined when you increased them for this ordinance? Yeah, we don't have that data available. Okay. That that would be a lot of data to pull. But on average, like were most projects like ten points over, half a point over? No idea. I don't know the answer to that. How did you guys determine the number of points for for this? 
um, as Farhad explained okay. through the cost effectiveness study. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. And then I'll let sure. my colleagues speak. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So the studies take a prescriptive building to the energy code, prescriptive in all facets. So windows, insulation, you know, every component of the building, and it switches the gas appliance to electric to achieve the margins proposed today. In practice, some of the buildings that get submitted to the city may use that credit that exists and the studies depict to trade off some of those efficiencies by installing some worse windows or insulation or those kinds of things by reducing efficiency elsewhere. The state already has an electric preferred code that was by design. Um, that's the margin that we're capturing as part of this proposal. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to go here, then I'm going here. Okay. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just I had one or I had two questions. One was in regards to one of the scenarios that you shared, which was the uh, scenario in which the individual or the builder could have mixed gas and electric, one of which would be to keep the gas would require that they have a battery. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, just knowing the cost of the battery, if that's an automatic potential um, deterrent from wanting to even do gas because it would be so expensive. Do you know what I mean? Is that, that, is that question clear? It is clear. Okay. Um, again, the cost effectiveness is over the time. over time, right? It's not just the initial cost. Okay. I see. So you're factoring it that way and that yes. it would be an upfront significant cost, but over time, if that was something they chose to do, that would make sense. Okay. Yes. And then you also referenced, and I remember reading it, and I just can't find it at the moment, um, the legal kind of validity of our strategy, if this isn't in place, I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about that. Or what's at risk with us not having something like this in place for our climate action strategies? Um, so two questions there. What's at risk if we don't adopt something or like just this? just a little bit more context to that for kind of why this is important to have in the this is important for us to have in place because we modeled the enforcement of our natural gas prohibition in our target that we adopted. So right now, we are off track to meet our target because we've had a gap of six months and we are getting these mixed fuel buildings. So it's important for us to adopt this increased performance standard in order to make up that gap and make sure we don't lose any more as we work towards that legal target by 2030. Okay, thank you. That's okay. what I thought I heard. I just wanted to make sure. Sure. Clear. Thank you. Council Member Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Great. Thank you for the presentation. And um, I know this is really technical, and you guys probably all get it all, but um, appreciate you guys, your patience with us. Um, so I'm going to just maybe pick up the thread from where Vice Mayor Golder left it around those compliance margin standards. Um, I want to understand these better. Um, how, I think we, th th well, I won't speak for you. What I heard in your question is how feasible is it to meet those compliance standard margins? And so have we seen um, local applicants that have been able to meet those? And my follow-up question to that is, am I understanding correctly that the margins exceed what the state requires? And if so, um, are we, I might be answering my own question, are we proposing that our margins exceed state requires because we have fallen behind? So that's a lot of questions in one, and then I have some more questions. Okay, so first question is how feasible? Yes. Right? So I did share with you at least two compliance pathways for every building type. Mm -hmm. So it is feasible, um, and there are other combinations that could make that uh, meet the compliance margin. You asked secondly about local applicants and- Have we seen local applicants that have, well, I mean, this isn't code yet, but have we seen local applicants that have been able to meet or could meet those um, margin, compliance margin standards? I don't see those day to day, so I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if John would know that either. No, we, I mean, we generally just look at it, what, whatever the code is at the time we review it. Or what Sir, was excuse me, I'm gonna need you to get a little closer, thank you. <laughs> We look at whatever code is in effect when we review or when the uh, permit is applied for. So the fact that this ordinance is not yet in place, there would be nothing for us to check on that. There's various ways uh, people can uh, 
meet compliance. Mm -hmm. And the uh, source metric is just one component of that. Um, would, would it be possible to look at the source metric for, I don't know, the last six months to a year to pull that information? You could, but you, um, I think Farhad alluded to this earlier, you can't really separate that from the rest of the, okay. it's like apples of the and factors oranges. because they may have done something over here that, that um, made their compliance margin on the other table less than it would, okay. would be otherwise. I think I understand. Okay, so then the next part was um, why, are, why are our proposals higher than what the state requirement is? Because we're asking for increased performance in the buildings so that we can drive greater greenhouse gas emissions okay. reductions. Okay, okay, thank you. Then, um, then the other sort of comment question I have is, I, I think you, you've made it clear that um, this is only for new buildings moving forward, but there's some very confusing language in the um, ordinance. Um, there's several sections where it refers to um, requirements of this section, one. 30.0 through 130.6 also applied additions and alterations to existing buildings. And I understand that that's because of the state code, but if you could, one, clarify that, and then two, um, could we, should we move forward, could we provide language that really explicitly upfront says that this is for, ex for new buildings moving forward? Yes, I'm gonna pass it to John on this, but the language was simply retained from the existing code. It does not apply to existing buildings, renovations and so forth. Um, and there was one part that you other that you mentioned. Could we provide explicit language um, yes. as part of the ordinance that basically says, ignore this. I mean, not really, but. Yes, we can do that. Um, I think we might even be prepared to do so today. Looks like um, Mr. Butler had a comment on yes. that. Good afternoon, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning and Community Development Director, and thank you for that question, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, um, and for sending that to us in advance. Um, I can certainly understand why there was confusion around that when, uh, as you pointed out, there are a number of uh, locations. In fact, we identified four locations where <clears throat> it, uh, the existing code language calls um, the uh, additions and alterations out and uh, potential applications. In each of those four locations, I uh, would propose that we add the following note to, to clarify this. Um, just a simple statement saying that nothing in the local amendments affects additions or alterations to existing buildings. Um, I did uh, confer with our technical experts here um, both John and Farhad, and um, I think that that is going to be uh, sufficient because we are not affecting any other, none of our other local amendments affect those additions or alterations. And um, so I, I believe that would address the concern um, without um, adding uh, any uh, challenges to the, to the uh, way that ordinance would be implemented. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Those are my questions for now. <laughs> For the questions, comments. <laughs> Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I'm here at the end because um, some of my questions were answered. And just continuing, um, Lee Butler, <laughs> I'm going to continue where this left off um, because that was part of my question in receiving correspondence. Thank you for making it clear it was new construction. Um, there was confusion from people who read the agenda packet that it would affect existing buildings and concern um, over not having PG&E or general contractors or people that would really know um, as part of the process and also concern over potentially evicting tenants. There were just a lot of concerns and so when we get to the point of existing buildings somewhere in the future, I imagine. I hope that those suggestions can be taken um, into consideration. And the suggestion you just made on nothing in the local amendment affects additions or alterations to existing buildings. Could it just say existing buildings? Why do you have to add additions or alterations? Because then it still leaves that 
kind of question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the reason why I had that in the proposed language is because in each instance where there was uh, confusion in the language that's pulled from the current energy code, and I can, I can read one of those, um, you know, section 141. Uh, let's see, the requirements of section 140.1 through 140.10 apply to newly constructed buildings. And it goes on to say, section 141 specifies which requirements of 140.1 through 140.10 also apply to additions or alterations to existing buildings. And so that's where I, I believe the confusion arose um, for members of the community who are reading the ordinance carefully is because um, they were saying, they were believing that to mean that um, something was going to affect additions or alterations. Okay. Um, this, it, the changes that we are making in each of those sections do not affect additions or alterations. And that takes a lot of digging through the code um, I was relying on my technical experts to, to do that digging and to follow that trail and to show me that, yes, um, there aren't any changes that are um, uh, implement, uh, that are included on accident. And we've confirmed that that's the case, and therefore we can have this. I don't see an issue with just taking out the additions and alterations. Um, I'll look to the technical experts. Uh, it's it's more consistent with the code, the way the code. I'll leave is it up to you all to, but I think you understand the yep. intent of where we're coming from. And I'm sorry, I missed who you were. I'm John McLucas. And who are you? I'm a, the deputy building official. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further, completed. Complete. Thank you. Thank you. The questions comes a couple of questions quickly. Um, I'm sorry. I, I just have two more that came in. So Go I, ahead, Madam Vice Chair. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, I heard Dr. Wise West say that we have to do this in order to meet our legal requirements. How are other jurisdictions meeting their legal requirements, like around the state? That's my big question. Maybe I don't know. Not every jurisdiction has a legal target. We do, um, and other jurisdictions either have adopted a natural gas prohibition, many of them did not suspend theirs like we did, or they have an electric preferred ordinance that they already adopted, or will be adopting something like this. Um, it does differ community to community. There are different stack of measures, um, you know, for every community as to how to meet that. Um, that legal target, and this is a big chunk of ours. And this is because of what we, the, the policy that we adopted to try to meet those state um, that's requirements that's in 2030. Correct. Okay, got it. And then my final question, I don't wanna put Chief Odie on the spot back there, but my question is about battery storage, and this just had me thinking when we were eliminating um, parking requirements, batteries for these projects are typically not stored in inside, right? They're like in garages or but outdoors. If, or but they can't they have to be covered. They have they can't just be in the elements, correct? They uh, more or less. I mean they, they they're either going to have their own housing or they're going to be in a building or the or in the garage. I mean there's there's it depends on what scale what what type of project you're talking about and what I'm the just scale thinking is. of a residential single family or a duplex like that doesn't that we're no longer requiring off-street parking or covered parking like we had in the past. That's all changed since 2020. And then these battery, these Tesla batteries or these Tesla power walls, they're fairly large. And if you get two or three of them, where can you safely store them if you can't get them wet? And do, are those in the designs that are submitted for yes. approval too? Yeah, they would have to comply with the manufacturer's installation instructions and the California Electrical Code as far as installation. Okay. You asked the chief to come forward. I, well, I was just chief. seeing I, it, about, am I right? They, and maybe you don't know the answer. They can't be stored out in the elements. That's a good question. Um, Rob Odie, fire chief. <clears throat> um, so there, again, uh, Mr. McClickus is correct that it has to fall under the, 
the the electrical code, the fire code, but more importantly, the manufacturer's recommendation. And so I can't speak to Tesla and the other power walls. I have seen them installed exterior and interior on a garage. Um, and again, I don't know the specifics of what differentiates the acceptability of interior and exterior, but I have seen them in both um, settings. A lot, a lot of the bigger installations, you'll see uh, basically something that looks like a, like a container, a cargo container. That'll be the battery system. Good afternoon. Hi, Council. Uh, Matt Van Watt, Principal Planner. I can just speak anecdotally on this, uh, Councilmember Golder. Um, I had a solar and battery system installed last year on my home, and my battery is outside, fully met permitting requirements, fire building, everything. It comes just in a, like a fire or a, a weatherproof case. Okay. And uh, my interconnection with pg e was about two and a half months. So pretty fairly quick. Absolutely. Thank you. To some extent, it seems that we've got a couple of different public policy goals we're trying to balance here. One is this council is obviously very interested in housing affordability as we're moving through time. And we have a large commitment to affordable housing development, construction, and occupancy. And if I understood it correctly, uh, one of the arguments in favor of the additional cost component is that if you look at the life cycle of it over time, this is at least no less efficient than or it's no more or less. You can recover this over, over a period of time in your savings on your energy bill. Is that essentially correct? You make the capital improvement here. That's expensive, but over time you can recover that because your energy bill is less. Is that right? Thank you, Mary. Yes, it is. And also that in some instances, the cost of construction could be less. Could be less at the outcome. Right. Okay. So on those items, I, I, I suspect this may be true. I don't know it to be true. Uh, that you put a hard capital cost in up front, the builder of that single family home or the owner of the single family home or the old developer of a multifamily uh, structure, et cetera, they have that capital cost up front. Uh, then they are going to price the product, whether it's the sale of the home or it's the rent of the rental unit and so on, to recover their costs as quickly as possible, I assume. And although it is true, I'm willing to stipulate that it's true, that over time, whoever is paying that bill, which in the case of the homeowner is the homeowner, in the case of the renter, it's a pass-through, they're going to pay it over time. But that first instance of attempting to recover the capital cost by the owner of the multifamily unit, for example, they're going to plug that in early, I suspect, same way they are all other capital costs that they have to regard to recover those as quickly as possible. So. The, the issue I have here is the increased cost at the front end and what that does to housing affordability. It may be that your answer to that is it's almost indistinguishable over time, or it may be that an individual developer wants to recover that more quickly, which then increases the cost of the product. Am I not viewing the, you're shaking your, you're nodding your head, not shaking, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Why don't you come forward and we'll talk about this for a minute. And maybe Mr. Yes. Butler too. Yes. <laughs> Good um, afternoon, sir. I, 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 uh, Mayor, I think your um, uh, thought process is very sound. Um, I do have some numbers pulled here from the cost effectiveness analysis. Um, there are upfront cost increases associated with uh, these packages. Um, over time, they do have net present value uh, savings uh, over time, but it's difficult to ascertain exactly what the business model is going to be uh, for a given developer and for uh, a particular tenant. So, that, that Let me generally. ask you this. Let me ask you this. In the range of current costs, let's say somebody wants to build a three-bedroom, two-bath home, fully compliant today, uh, and now we adopt this ordinance. So we have a pretty good idea 
the cost of money, the cost of construction, the cost of building materials, the cost of labor, the cost of property, etc. I mean, we have a it's not completely ambiguous. It, it's going to change parcel to parcel, building to building. I understand that. But it's a knowable, relatively knowable idea uh, what that cost is going to be. Is this a 1% increase in cost? Is this a 0.5%? Is this a 12%? Do you have any idea sure. what this does to a... Because the, the reason I ask is you've done good work. You've done good work in saying, let us show you various building types and examples of how you could get to goal. So my question then is, if you know that much, do you know the rest of this about the cost issues here? I'll uh, take you through... Uh, that thought process, so a three bed, two bath home, 2,500 square feet, cost to construct $300 a square foot, roughly. I don't know if that's that's accurate, but it's Not seven, counting land costs. Not cost counting. Cost of construction. Cost Fair of enough. construction, $300 a square foot. Uh, that comes out to about $750,000 to build a, to build that home. Um, the magnitude of costs that we see for a single family home for the all electric building is around $3,500 in savings for avoiding that gas pipe versus around $7,500 cost increase um, for that mixed fuel building and having that battery. So we're talking, let's just say, let's just say it's even $10,000 or $15,000. Okay. Um, so 15 divided by 750, it's 2%. Okay. So it's about Roughly, I'm not going to hold you to that, but one to two percent. Roughly, it's a, it's in the couple of percent range, though, yeah. at the at the outside. So we adopt this. Admittedly, over time, there's lots of it. Now, I'm also assuming that there. I think you indicated this, that in order to achieve compliance, someone comes in, they they do this, they pick one of these alternative paths to get there to achieve our local ordinance and that has a capital cost associated with it of some kind. Am I right, did I hear it correctly, that there are ways you can go to recover some of that capital cost? Uh, there are state or other programs which can help bring the government in as a partner in this increased cost, or the public utility. Is it, did I get that right or did I not get that right? I didn't catch the exact last part. I heard the utility. I'm sorry, I was conferring um, with uh, Mr. Butler. But I was going with it is whether it's the IOU or it's the Energy Commission or you know the person in the moon. The, the, the I'm assuming there are paths. I say, okay, I want to do this the most electric option here possible. That's how I want to do it, and I have a two percent hard cost increase in my cost of building because of that. Is there a program or programs either through the Public Utilities Commission or the Energy Commission or the investor-owned utilities for me because I'm helping them hit their targets as well by doing this. So are they coming in and saying, we're going to give you an economic incentive to do the right thing on this? There is an all electric rate through Central Coast Community Energy. So yes, there. Um, I think that the, um, the figures that Farhad was referencing do account for the existing incentives that exist right now though, right? No, they don't. So there are all of the incentives that I included, yes. which are substantial. Mm -hmm. And one last point that I'd like to make is that for a, an all electric building, we currently have a requirement of all electric buildings. So we are not asking for anything, or there would not be a cost increase associated with that unless you have a mixed fuel building with the upfront cost, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we already have in place. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that was clear is that we're only talking about the mixed fuel building that has an additional cost over what we have right now in place for our ordinance. Thank you. You're Mr. welcome. Butler, you had a comment? I was just going to highlight that point uh, a little bit um, more um, uh, because, um, as Farhad mentioned, on a single family, if you're going all electric, then it actually is a reduced cost compared to the standard. But then if you're meeting our reach code and you're using a mixed fuel, that's where he, he had the 
seventy eight hundred eight thousand ten thousand. Yeah, that's the the cost as Councilmember Watkins was referring to the expense of battery storage or something else. If you're doing that mixed fuel, you've got to do that extra level. But there are some cost savings if you're not installing the gas pipe, mm -hmm. and so that's where you get that small three thousand five hundred dollar savings or something like that on a single family. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. I have, I have one follow-up question. It was sort of the question I was getting at with the um, 2030 goal. So certainly we want to meet our greenhouse gas you know, reduction, but I also know that as a leader, we are able to access grants as a result of our work that's really you know, ahead. And I'm wondering if we aren't able to meet that, is there any risk at not being able to receive grants or be eligible for certain things if we're not meeting that goal? No, there is not. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments by council? Let me open this to public comment. Anyone who's with us today wishes to comment on this item, please come forward. And let me ask Ms. Bush, do we have uh, anyone online at this time? Come on. Ms. Seals, come on. Here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, we strongly supported the previous ordinance for All Electric, and we strongly support this. Congratulate Tiffany on uh, some pivoting there to uh, deal with the fact that this lawsuit sort of derailed the original and hope we can get back to this as soon as possible. And I do want to remind people that climate, the climate crisis, it's like it gets worse every day. It, if you keep reading, it, it, it you're not going to find stuff that says, oh, we can forget about this. It's not a big deal. It certainly is a big deal, and it's certainly going to hurt our children, grandchildren. And we need to do everything we possibly can. In this particular case, buildings are something this city can control. 70% of our emissions are from vehicles, and that's a lot harder. And while I see a lot of bikes, I seem like I see just as many cars, but I'm hoping... Uh, but, but we have a long way to go on that. And so we cannot afford to slack on this particular one, which is within your control. And if there are inconveniences or possible um, problems for lower income people, it would be a good investment, if necessary, for the city to chip in so that that does not come become a, an equity issue, because it shouldn't. So... Uh, please uh, support this and please fo move forward and lots of good interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you. What we're going to do is toggle back and forth between people in the chambers and folks online. We'll take one online, then you're up next after the person online. Person online, good afternoon. Yes, hello. This is Garrett again. Hey, one of the fundamental flaws in America is that laws and regulations are now written instead of by legislators, by outside interests or unrestrained, unelected bureaucrats that the public cannot vote out. Here we go again. Instead of just going along with already unreasonable anti-natural gas state regulations, our resident untouchable unelected bureaucrat wants to go all in with an extremely totalitarian judicial end around forcing uh, natural gas used to be made unaffordable since it couldn't be banned outright. The cost of building and operating housing with this ordinance will add uh, plenty to the upfront cost, along with your outrageous gr green building fees and all the rest. Chasing efficiency is a diminishing returns game and an increasingly costly process. And at some point, we just need more energy, and you want to eliminate what provides 40% of our energy. As to these so-called studies used as justification, I actually read them, they are clearly written by biased utilities with vested self-interest, and they are not objective, nor are they peer-reviewed studies. They make it clear they can't justify these so-called reach, as in reach into your wallet, proposals, especially in our climate zone, based on what we normally think of as costs, such as utility bills we receive. Instead, they have created models amortizing far-reaching cost factors over 30-year time span involving hundreds of assumptions which may not be valid over time. In fact, I know a lot of them are not. I'll wager mucho dinero is not a one of you can actually explain in detail to the soon-to-be decarbonized midtown beach flat residents so that they understand 
exactly how and where the numbers came to be in this newfangled time-dependent valuation energy cost comparison chart because that information is not actually in those documents. It makes biased assumptions about everything. For instance, the natural gas prices will go up 4.6% annually and electricity only up 1.6% until 2030, and then they drop and stay low. Uh, in reality, natural gas prices have varied over time by an order of magnitude and were 400% higher when these studies were done compared to 2020. Interest rates can vary wildly, technology evolves, and what a typical home is can change. The reality is government electrification mandates like rooftop solar and, and these do-nothing duplicate electric fuel appliance spare capabilities greatly increase costs to be unaffordable if you want to use gas. Actual projects can always be fairly compared to housing models, and you want to push these mandate penalties even further than our climate change zombie apocalypse state does. How exactly the data and weightings from one-sided biased assumptions produced this mysterious TDV model energy valuation comparison, well, they don't exactly say. All this cost and loss of freedom because of the agenda of fear, power, and control that chooses to ignore that the entire CO2 crisis hoopla denies the fact that humans are not and never have been, and certainly little Santa Cruz, if not the entire world, will ever be in control of the climate on planet Earth. Uh, I would just like to mention the disclaimer that is in all of these studies. It says, fill in the blank utility name, makes no warranty, express or implied, or assumes any legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, or usefulness of any data, information, method, product, policy, nor process disclosed in this document. Cat litter boxes come with better product claims. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hello, Consul. It's been a long time since COVID, I think, since I've been in. Jacqueline Griffith, 42-year resident, educator in the area. I, I want to speak for this uh, uh, main preach. Um, I think there's probably even a, a, a benefit in your insurance, your homeowner's insurance um, rate because if you don't have any natural gas you are less apt to have a fire in the home or a blow up or a leak from your national gas which we know can even cause explosions and has within the last few years in california causing death and and neighborhood fires where was that big one all right the other thing i wanted to point out is just that natural gas is methane and we know that, I mean, largely, it's methane. And we know that methane is, what, 38 times worse than carbon dioxide? And we know that every time we have, where, do, where does our natural gas come from? Probably out of state or at least far, far, hundreds of miles from here. And we know that there is methane leaking all the way along the pipelines. We have not been able to control that. So when you think about climate change and how it's a worldwide thing, we can't just, our measurements that we have dealing with for this are for how much, what you're using in your house costs, but it's not taking into account the fact that you have a natural gas pipeline with a certain pressure and amount that it's trying to supply here, and that that means there's methane leaking all the way along. So when we, I don't know whether it's a factor of 10 or 50 or only two, but we know that the amount of climate change actually from natural gas use as opposed to electricity, especially when it's good green electricity, is far, far greater than what we measure it to be at the building level. So I really support and hope that you will go along with this. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? We're going to toggle back and forth here, so we'll be with you in just a moment. Person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Ed. Pete Kennedy calling in. Um, you saw my comments from the Planning Commission. Today I'm calling just as a citizen. 
and this is what I do in my day job, so I'm super passionate about it. Um, Got to say, this is totally critical. I'm on big projects in Santa Cruz right now that are going to go for this loophole if we leave it open. I want to restate that this is really simple. We're doing one thing. We had to take a break, and we're going to get back to doing it, but this is just plugging in that hole. It's nothing new. It's nothing special beyond what we were doing earlier um, before the lawsuit came. Um, I don't really care about the little projects. I don't think they're very affected. You know, I'm very sensitive to cost, of course, but it's the big buildings I'm worried about. Each 200-unit apartment building with a gas connection is a big deal for me um, as a Santa Cruzan. So I just wanted to go back to a few things. Oh, I'm seeing the timer there. Uh, the builder doesn't care about people's utility bills. Like, that's the key thing, right? So they're just looking at first cost. But we all, affordability-wise, do care about that, especially for lower-income folks. Um, my anecdote is that my family spent $1,600 on natural gas. I actually call it toxic methane, not natural gas, last winter. That's crazy. And so we spent twenty grand on a on a solar PV system, very happy to have that capital available. It'll cost us 13 grand after the rebates. Do the math, like that thing is gonna pay itself off so fast, it's just incredible. So that's my little example there. Um, but my point is the all electric future is where we gotta be now, just based on cost for ongoing utility costs for everybody. So what else? Uh, the PG&E thing, I hear you, but it's kind of a red herring. That's not our problem. We can't control them. PG&E hookups are slow whether you're doing natural gas. They're slow if you're doing regular electricity. They're slow if you're doing PV. So it's kind of like the whole system is just slow, which is a problem. Um, I didn't have that problem. I was energized right away and interconnected. But again, I'm just a small house. Um, so report from the day job. We looked at the downtown library project, which I'm working on. It's not done with design. We're at about like 100 dB on that project. Um, and it's not having a problem with this at all. The council person asked if current projects are meeting that EDR1 score, and the answer is yes, that's no problem whatsoever on a big project like that. Um, and I don't know about costs. I doubt it costs more at the end of the day, though the, the plumbers and everyone will charge you extra, you know, that's just how things work. Um, we also do a lot of like EDUs, little additions and a couple of single family homes in the city. And I talked to our guy who does that work. He said, you know, you can still get by with a gas furnace or a gas water heater if that's your goal. But this is going to make it really hard to do both of those things and still sneak through the system. So, you know, that's fine. We just want to push people a little bit and not too far. I'm getting my ding here. Uh, let me finish with two quick thoughts. I remember when solar panels were crazy and everyone was worried about them catching on fire and stuff. That was like nine years ago. And now it's mandatory on all new buildings. Like, I mean, I was in those meetings where people were, were like, oh, God, the solar panels are going to catch on fire. The fire department's going to gonna kill us. Let's yeah, take just a deep so breath. we're clear with Batteries each other, you got to, so we're clear with each other. You got Good, about five seconds. Am I done? All right, cool. I'm done. We're in leaders. We're leaders here in Santa Cruz. Right on, Tiffany. Thank, Let's thank, stick with our thank leadership. Thank you very much. I wish we'd go further. Thanks. No, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Mayor Keeley and council members, uh, my name is Susan Cavalieri. I just want to uh, make a short, uh, some short points on the climate situation. It, 2023 has been the warmest year on record. From January to September, the, main, the mean global temperature was 1.4 degrees higher than pre-industrial levels. The goal of the Paris Climate Agreement, as you I'm sure know, was to keep the mean global temperature well below two degrees and preferably to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. We are dangerously close to the 1.5 degree limit. Methane or natural gas is 80 times more harmful than CO2 
in the atmosphere. Please pass the ordinance to decrease methane and begin to control global warming in Santa Cruz. We don't have much time to drastically reduce emissions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Magnell. Uh, I've been um, in the building construction industry for over 40 years here in Santa Cruz. Um, my company's uh, been in business here for much longer than that even. Um, I support the efforts of this ordinance to reduce the greenhouse emissions and help um, prepare uh, buildings and homes to accommodate uh, future energy systems um, and as the energy code already requires most new homes and buildings to be almost all electric or close to all electric, um, I think we're on the right track. Um, I think the council's asking the right questions here, um, of this ordinance and getting clarification on some of the items. Um, but I'm going to restate some of them, um, just because I think it's important for, um, the average citizen um, that may be thinking about um, doing a ADU or a new home uh, because the costs are so high. Um, are the complications of this REACH code um, absolutely necessary and worthwhile? Um, because it's going to be problematic for a lot of the users of this ordinance because of the additional um, costs. Um, are the points um, the points or percentages above the energy compliance baseline um, even possible to achieve on all projects? And I, I say that it, you know most things are possible, but sometimes they come with a cost that is um, extreme. And, and I think in some of the cases here, um, they may be extreme. I have several brand new homes that have been built in Santa Cruz, uh, city of Santa Cruz, county of Santa Cruz in the last couple of years. Um, some of them all electric and none of them have, even the all electric homes um, haven't really been above the required percentages required by by maybe one to two percentage points, not, not anything much more than that. So I'm worried if, um, you know, that we're trying to get these extra nine points for a, a residential project and, and um, uh, you know, a percentage for multifamily. Um, so at what, what cost for this additional work? Um, is it proportionate? Um, can the citizens of Santa Cruz really afford this, these costs? Um, these questions really need to be clearly answered um, and defined in some of the cases um, before moving forward. Um, one of my, just quickly, one of my suggestions would be to lower the uh, percentage points and um, to a lower level to make it a little bit easier for most people to comply. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hello, and thank you, council members. My name is Sophia Schwartzke, and I am a customer accounts manager with Central Coast Community Energy, or 3CE. And I'm here today to express 3CE's support for the city's REACH code efforts. Your city has emerged as a climate leader through the adoption of your climate action program and the establishment of community-wide greenhouse gas reduction goals including achieving a 40% uh, reduction by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2035, among other initiatives. Adoption of the proposed code amendment incentivizing electrification aligns with the city's greenhouse gas reduction goals, is cost effective, and is further supported by rebates and incentives offered by 3CE to encourage the electrification of accessory dwelling units and affordable housing. 3CE's governing boards have identified electrification as a strategic goal, recognizing that all electric buildings are cost-effective, highly efficient, provide cleaner indoor air quality, 
and provide substantially lower operational emissions than buildings that use gas appliances. As individuals, the most significant action we can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance air quality is to transition from fossil fuel appliances in, and vehicles to all electric alternatives. Currently, 3CE supplies 50% clean and renewable energy to our customers, and we are on track to reach 60% clean and renewable energy by the year 2025, which is five years ahead of the state of California's goal. Our strategic commitment is to meet 100% of our energy demand with clean and renewable resources by the year 2030, which is a full 15 years ahead of the goal set by our state. And this is in perfect alignment with your sustainable municipal government measure M2 to procure carbon-free or 100% renewable electricity for municipal operations by 2030. Together, the City of Santa Cruz and 3CE are poised to achieve our climate and clean energy objectives, and we enthusiastically support this REACH Code effort. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. Please pass out thanks and appreciation on to your colleagues and to your organization. Mr. Huppaker serves on the technical board. I serve on the policy board, and that agency does great work every day. We have anyone else online? Nobody yeah. with their hand raised. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Council, it's not board. Council. That's right. Um, I'm James Blumquist. I own A Plus Green Energy Service. We have been doing Title 24 and green building documentation here in Santa Cruz County for over 40 years. We model close to 1,000 dwelling units a year out of our office. So if anybody knows what and why and how it's going to get to the ground, it's probably us. And uh, I commend these guys for their work. They have great studies, but I've been doing it longer than most of them have been alive. <laughs> okay? And I know what people are doing and what they actually see in the field because also as a HERS rater and a 100-year contractor for my family, we've been out there a long time. Um, for Ms. Golders, the reason that doesn't apply to additions and alterations is the metric is not there for the source energy when you do an addition or alteration. The source metric, energy metric, total metric is only available to new construction. So the 9% in the source energy is going to be very extremely expensive and difficult to meet with a mixed fuel building. So my question to this council and to the city is, why did you bother just go back to what you had? Santa Cruz County has an all electric ordinance for homes, new construction. Santa Clara County, Palo Alto, San Mateo, San Carlos, they're everywhere. City of San Jose, you have to abandon the gas line at the street, in the middle of the street, if you tear down a home in San Jose and build a new one in its place. If you want to meet your 2035, just go back to what you had. Setting the standard of a source metric with a gas infrastructure is going to force people into heavy, heavy, heavy solar and battery commitments that aren't even necessary in small ADUs. You can't get it in a small ADU without adding solar. But the state, in their wonderful wisdom this year, said, hey, if it's a small ADU, you don't have to put solar on it anymore because it was deemed too expensive. The second phase of this is the cost-effective study is one thing. But it's my interpretation and been my experience over the last 40 years that any above-code program that's submitted to the state of California, whether it be in a green program or an energy program must be deemed effective by the demographic of the community. Can your community pay the money for that increased value that they have to put into those homes going in? Not whether it pays off in 30 years, that's a whole different story. Okay, and then my, I wanna close really quickly that this is also being met, climate change is also being met with the Cal Green Code. And this city has a green code that is super outdated. And it should be looking at that as well as this to meet your overall goal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
I, my principal concern was already addressed. I thought it applied to existing buildings as well. And um, I would like, I have a seven unit uh, multi-residential property with a very modern electrical system, but I can tell you it would probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars if I had to uh, go pull out all the gas. Um, and I'd, I'd invite any of you guys to tour it with me and I can, I can show you. Uh, I, in its term, terms of 3C and rebates, I did go through their concierge service just to try to get two uh, EV chargers. They wanted, it was, a, it was a nightmare. It wasn't concierge. <laughs> but in any case, bottom line, it was going to be $53,000 plus I would have had to pay for a whole bunch of paving for two EV chargers. That's, that's not anything water heaters, FAUs, nothing. So I think you guys really need... Uh, before you reinstitute any existing building ordinances, you really need to get with some people who are on the ground, who have real-world experience and not just sitting in an office doing some studies. Because I can tell you, it's not going to be smooth. It's not going to be fun. Also, you've been fed some misinformation from staff, and I know they do a good job, but I just want to be real with you guys. 2045, as a 3C rep said, that's when we're going to go 100% renewable, if we can. And that's dependent. That's... The estimation is we're going to have to triple our electricity production in the state and get rid of Diablo, which accounts for like about 10% of our production. So it's ambitious. Even the people who are pushing it agree it's ambitious. It's reliant on offshore wind, of which we don't have any right now. So whether we get there or not, I don't know. Dr. Wise West said 2030. That's not true. If she's counting on 3CE, which the 3CE rep just said, we don't get a single watt of energy from 3C. They don't produce any, this is their map. They don't produce, there's no generating facilities for 3CE in the Tri-County area. There's one battery facility. So we're getting electricity from the grid. So if you think 3C is great, maybe they are, but we're not directly consuming what 3C generates. So, you know, <laughs> we're just getting stuff off the grid. So as far as, and that gets to my other point about even with existing, um, with new buildings, 40% of, elect of electricity is produced with fossil fuels, with natural gas in California. At those plants, there's, it's about 30% efficient. That means you lose about 70% of the energy in the, embedded in the natural gas just in the production. There's further losses in, in transmission and distribution. A modern forest air unit is about 95 to 98% efficient. So until we do actually get to much closer to 100% renewable, it's most likely we're gonna be burning more greenhouse gas by ripping out 95% FAUs and putting in heat pumps. And just be real quick here, staff also told you at a previous meeting that heat pumps were 350% efficient. That is only talking about at the point of use. It's not accounting for those transmission or generation losses. Also, heat pumps are only that efficient at relatively warm temperatures. So I think you need, I mean, I drive an electric car, I have a, a PV array, I have a solar hot water system. I agree we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to be really critical about how we do it. And we don't want to be the leaders in greenwashing. We want to be the leaders in really being green. And so I think you really need to think about this more carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for your input. <laughs> Anybody else online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else in chambers wish to, the matter is back before the council. Ms. Brown's recognized. I'll move the staff recommendation for first reading of this ordinance. Would you like me to read it there, out? No, I don't think you need to. We, I think it's included. There's a motion. Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. Is there another? Mo I'll second. Oh. Well, you need to you need to say second when I ask for it. We got a second, or sure. are you doing it? Do you want to do it second? Huh? I'll second the motion. A motion and a second. Open on the motion. I have a question, if I may. No, let's do this. <laughs> Open on the motion, then we'll recognize you for a question. Sure. I, well, I will just say that um, I, you know I've been following this very closely. I was uh, I learned a lot about reach codes prior to our actual natural gas prohibition ordinance. I'm very, I'm very supportive of moving forward in any and all ways that we can. We are in a uh, dire crisis. I'm not going to wax forth about that. Um, but we have to do everything we possibly can 
to uh, you promote uh, alternatives to, to natural gas, um, to reduce carbon emissions. If anybody has a question about that, um, you know, I, I, I think that right now the science is very clear, and so you know, I, I don't necessarily feel the need to kind of re-litigate the question of whether or not we're moving in this direction. I recognize that um, this does uh, mean that the, the the pathways create some kind of administrative and and other complications, but it is the right thing to do, and so I'm very supportive of that. I um, I would have been happy to stick with uh, maintaining our prohibition on the books, um, but given the uh, you know advice that we received from legal counsel, uh, was willing to go along in this case. Um, I think that uh, our staff have worked very hard to find uh, a path forward, and I, I appreciate it. Further on this, uh, Ms. Watkins is right. My question is in regards to the proposed language that. Um, Lee Butler uh, offered. Is that incorporated in the motion that you're proposing? I did. I did not incorporate it, um, but I am happy to entertain thoughts on that if that's of interest. Yeah, I mean, my I, preference is just a clean. But I'm, that's fine with me. I offer a friendly amendment to change the language to have more clarity around how this does not apply to existing buildings, as suggested by. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So let me let's slow it down here. There's a friendly amendment offered to direct staff in bringing this back for the next reading to have statements in the ordinance which make it clear that this ordinance does not apply to remodels or expansions of existing structures of any kind. Is I accept. Ms. Bush, you have that? We're good? Okay, further on this? Yeah, further. Ms. Kantar Johnson is recognized. I was going to make that friendly amendment, so it's been made. Um, but I will just make a couple comments now, if that's uh, appropriate. Um, I hear the concerns that some community members have brought forward in terms of um, what does it really look like on the grounds. That's that's was the nature of the questions that I asked. Is is it feasible? Have we seen um, folks who've been able to? implement parts of this and, and I understand that this reach code is a new component so we haven't been able to test it so um, I guess it's a question and a comment is how will we track this closely how will we engage the boots on the ground folks to make sure that implementation is feasible and that it the cost isn't prohibitive for building affordable housing um, I'm I'm gonna be inclined to support this um, with that friendly amendment that was made but I do um, I hear the concerns of the community and, and want to be assured that we're working closely with the community to, to make sure we can, that implementation is feasible. I guess it's not really a question, it's a comment. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Uh, I do, I could hear you <laughs> inhaling. <laughs> request to speak. So I just want to be clear, if we adopt this today, this replaces, but if the decision with the Ninth Circuit goes the other way, the other one replaces, or this one still stays in place? The intent is that we would rescind this ordinance and go back to the natural gas prohibition because that is the strongest greenhouse gas emissions reduction and what was modeled for our compliance with our target. Would it come back before us? Yes, of course. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand that which it is coming back before it would come back before us. Should, should the uh, case be resolved such that we would want to go back to our natural gas uh, prohibition, we would come back to council to rescind this ordinance if indeed it, it is adopted and remove the suspension from the natural gas prohibition. That would require council action to do so. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions, comments? Mr. Condotti, did you have something on this? I'm sorry, you had your... Um, just briefly, that yes. would in effect be a new ordinance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me ask another question. We, we have gotten input, so the, this is our first reading. The, the ordinance will require a second reading when it returns to us, correct? That's right. And when that second reading is on our agenda, the 
friendly amendment will be adopted. That'll, that'll be before us as well. This will all be here in the second reading of the ordinance, correct? That's right. I understood the motion to include the language yes, that was does. suggested by the planning. Yes, group. and we would adopt that today so that when we see the second reading of the ordinance, that would be in it. Correct. Okay. Is it, would it also be correct that at the second reading, is there an opportunity at second reading to make any changes in the ordinance? And if there is, what would that then do to the readings? That would require it to be brought back for another second reading second or for reading. final adoption. That's so correct. in effect, there's two bites at the apple on this ordinance. Today, when it comes back for second reading with the friendly amendment, and if that is further amended on second reading next time, then we would repeat that process for yet another second reading because we will have amended the ordinance. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, the reason I'm doing that is to make sure that others who are here who think that we should make additional amendments to the ordinance, you have that opportunity to do so. Uh, we may or may not accept those, but you have the opportunity to, to offer such changes. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you very much. Further debate or discussion? I intend to support the motion today. Uh, I am open-minded about whether we can make this a better ordinance. I want to thank the staff. I think this is, this is a very technical work, obviously. And to find a path the way you did where what we wanted to do and a court making a, a, you know, a, a trial court decision and how we continue on, thank you. That, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. You've done a great job on that. And I'm not going to put a comma that erases that. I mean that. That is wonderful work. I do think that, at least for my part of this, I'm going to be open-minded about whether there are other amendments we could take which would keep faith with the spirit of this ordinance. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when this comes back, uh, uh, understand that, that at least as one member of the council, I reserve the right to make other arguments at the time we have second reading uh, next time this comes back. Further questions or comments? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Parliamentary Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellent Council. Work. Excellent work all around. Public members who provided input, thank you. Keep providing it. We're on item 18. This is development impact fees, annual report for the child care and public service impact fees. Ms. Pearson, good afternoon. Well, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Vivian Pearson, and I am with the Planning and Community Development Department. Um, I'm also grateful for the Fire and Police Department and the Office of Economic Development and Housing for joining me here today. Uh, I am pleased to be able to give you an annual update for the fiscal year 2023 um, Child Care and Public Safety Impact Fee Report uh, for Fire and Police. The fees were effective in June 2021, and the impact fee goes towards uh, some of the public safety for fire and police, as well as for child care. The revenues collected for the past three fiscal years since 2021 are summarized here by the fiscal year. So starting with the child care impact fee, um, you we've collected for this fiscal year $51,000 for a ending balance of $72,000. For the public safety impact fee for police, uh, we have collected $90,000 for an ending balance of $109,000. Then also for the impact fee for fire, we've collected $86,000 this year for an ending balance of $107,000. Now for the fees for the public safety, um, fire and police do intend to use these funds towards uh, vehicles, apparatuses, um, upgrades, and using those funds towards those improvements and serving the future uh, 
residents and employees um, as a result. And then also the child care impact fees um, as city council considered last year after allocation towards the child care component of the library affordable housing project. Um, the rest of the funds will go towards a facility, a child care facility assessment. fee. Thank you. Brian. Also, there is a requirement to spend the funds within five years. So we're looking at 2026 um, as when we need to uh, utilize these funds. Now, the question before you today is going to also be the exemption of the 100% affordable housing. And when the council did approve this in June of 2021, 100% um, affordable housing was exempt from the morning. So um, I also wanted to highlight here that since 2021, there have been four projects um, that have been exempted. And so we did a estimate of what these numbers would look like. And so for public safety, for the ones that have already been exempted, that would have been $260,000 for public safety. It would have been $70,000 for child care impact fee. Now looking at the projects in the pipeline that we know of presently, we have four projects coming down. And for child care, for public safety fees, that would be $445,000 that would be exempt currently, and also $120,000 for child care. Now, these projects will increase demand for public safety and also impacts for our departments of fire and police, as well as child care. We wanted to create 100% affordable housing and create the incentive for that. And so we have the question before city council today uh, from June 2021, would you be interested um, in evaluating this exemption and do you want to uh, continue collection of maybe some or all or just consider an exemption from the child care and public safety impact fee ordinance? Thank you. That concludes my presentation, and thank you to Fire, Police, and Economic Development and Housing for joining me today. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. Uh, either chiefs wish to make some opening comments. If not, that's fine. Not compelling you to, but if you wish to. Okay. Anyone else? And, well, Chief, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Rob Bodie, Fire Chief, and uh, Council, thank you for the opportunity. Again, I think um, Ms. Pearson uh, gave a pretty compelling, um, you know, great, informative presentation. And um, I think she made a good point that I think um, Chief Escalante would agree that, again, it's not so much um, the, the fact that, you know, is it affordable, is it not affordable, it's the sheer number of these units and the square footage. And those only tell part of the story. I mean, some of those we're talking, I think, in total, those eight projects, over 400 units. And um, I believe it's 375,000 square feet. So again, from a fire perspective, that's a, a, a legitimate concern. But along with that, the other piece of that story is the size and scope of these structures. And it sort of is changing the dynamic, at least the landscape for the fire department and how we respond to these. So the people that are in these buildings, we are going from low and mid rise to mid and high rise. Um, all very necessary for what we're trying to achieve as a city. But again, I think we need to be very, um, um, we need to react in such a way that is realistic um, as we've seen in previous uh, requests for um, additional funding for fire apparatus. The cost for these this equipment has gone up 25 and in some cases even 52% for a variety of reasons. And so I'm just trying to make sure that we are being proactive in funding these efforts in the future. I'm happy to answer any questions in regards to this presentation and how it affects fire specifically if you do. Chief, thank you, sir. We ready for that? Ms. Kalantari-Johnson, we're ready. Okay, I do have some questions um, specific to the, um, the concerns you've brought up, Chief Odie. Uh, or, or maybe you can respond. I don't know who would respond. Do we have, we see how much we could have generated with these four projects that were affordable housing. Is there a way to determine what the cost impact of just even those four projects are? I'm not sure I understand the question in terms of the, what we've missed out on. What, what, what has, what would it cost um, the fire department, the police department to service let's say those four projects. Is that, I mean, maybe we don't have that number now, but is that, can we determine that? That's a great question. And I, I would actually, I think that would help us evaluate, you know, for the future, but I think I'll leave that to uh, uh, Director Butler. Okay, 
Thank you. Mr. Butler, good afternoon again. Thank you. So when this uh, was originally put into place, we did a nexus study and we evaluated upcoming costs for the uh, police and fire departments. And um, we based uh, the um, upcoming costs uh, on the service population, service population being um, number of residents and also number of uh, employees. We discount the number of employees because they typically demand fewer services than um, residents do, um, as is typical as part of a uh, nexus study. And we look at that overall costs divided by what our expected service population is, and then we uh, translate that, the costs per service population to square footage. Mm -hmm. And so um, in terms of the increment, um, we have set forth the fees in a manner that is expected to, to, to represent the incremental cost that those individuals would um, contribute to um, the additional fees from police and fire. So um, I know that that's kind of complicated, <laughs> but um, what, it, what it amounts to is, you know, their service demands, their needs from the police department to, to get new vehicles and, and so forth, but not all of those vehicles and, and such are attributable to the new residents. And, and the Nexus study tries to account for that. And um, so that's where we have the per square foot fee. So long way of saying the, the amount of money that we um, forego through the exemptions is estimated to okay. be the amount of money that we would spend, but it's just on the capital expenses. It's not services. Right. So impact fees are um, providing for capital expenditures, not for the service uh, increases. So you actually, please, um, you actually got to my other question. I, I sent an email in advance asking you this, Mr. Butler, how did we land on those fees? And I think you just explained that because I noticed that hotels were much um, less than other types of um, buildings. So I so I think you just described that, but if, if you want to just synthesize. Yeah, thanks Thanks for sending that in advance so that I could do some digging in advance. Um, hotels have a uh, number of employees. Uh, uh, the employee density, I will call it, is about one employee per 1,000 square feet. And the other uses, uh, the offices, for example, were um, one per, and I'm going from memory, 250 square feet or something. Retail was one per 300 square feet. And so because on a per square foot basis, hotels have fewer employees, mm -hmm. they resultingly have a lower per square foot cost. So it's all about the number of employees mm -hmm. um, and that's equated to the service that's needed. And I'm just, thinking about um, if we were to do something around this affordable housing and having impact face of affordable housing, um, obviously there's concerns about deterring or um, inability for affordable housing developers to be able to build with these additional impact fees. So how do we minimize those impacts? And, and I'm just wondering and thinking out loud if there are any ways for us to look at how those um, dollars have landed with the square footage and the service? I, I mean, you did an extensive nexus study, but is there a way to look at it more, have a more equitable approach? And I don't know that there is, but again, thinking out loud, if we are to do, um, look at putting impact fees on 100% affordable housing, what are some other ways we can generate that? That's a thought and a question. Um, and then sort of along those lines, um, I would be interested in hearing what it would look like if we had sort of a, a sliding scale or we charge some level or percentage of an impact fee for affordable housing rather than the full cost. So what would that look like? Um, and then the other, again, thinking out loud thought is just our affordable housing trust fund. And I'm, we've probably overcommitted what's in there, but uh, where is there opportunity to, to tap into that for these purposes? Thank you. More thoughts than real sure. questions. Yeah, um, and uh, just a quick response on a couple of those. Um, one, we would um, look at, w the question before the council right now is really, do you want us to look at options? Um, we um, 
it, we don't want to go off and, and do some studies and analysis and hear the different options and we've talked with the affordable housing developers and this is what they say if it's not uh, in the council's interest to um, to revisit this exemption um, so that's really what we're asking and yes we would certainly bring back those uh, those options for the council um, should you want us to do that second as far as the affordable housing trust fund um, this was a conversation that uh, the economic development director economic and housing developer or <laughs> economic development and housing director Bonnie Lipscomb and I were having earlier today um, uh, with respect to um, uh, some of these potential challenges, right? A affordable housing developer comes along and they uh, have a gap. And so then there's a request for the affordable housing trust fund to fill that gap. And so then are we really just transferring money from one fund to another? Um, and, and so those are questions that we will most definitely have to explore and understand um, before we make a, a decision on something like this. Um, and um, those conversations will take time. We don't want to spend that time if the council doesn't have an appetite for it. That's why we're here. Thank you. And I guess I'll just um, finish by saying I, I have an interest in exploring and um, I, I don't think, at this point, I don't think I would be in support of full impact fees on affordable, 100% affordable housing, but I'd be interested in exploring what the options are. Thank you. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Yes, thank you. Um, I too would be interested in exploring options. I think it's definitely something we should look at. I had a question in regards to any other impact fees. Are these the only two that we have uh, applied to our new buildings? We have um, transportation impact fees are typically a hefty one. We also have um, system development charges associated with um, the water. Um, uh, and um, I'm trying to think if I am forgetting. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I guess my question is, are those um, applied to the affordable projects as well, or are those also exempt for that? Those are applied to the, the affordable projects. Um, and. Um, we have a provision in our code that allows for um, uh, developers to 100% affordable housing developers, and I see Rosemary Menard is, is on as well. Uh, but we have a provision in our code that allows for uh, developers to 100% affordable projects to request um, fee deferrals and such. We have to be careful about that when it comes to um, uh, certain impact fees because then the city would have to backfill with public safety you know, we're spending general fund money on that anyway, but you can't have um, one developer cover the costs for uh, an affordable else? housing developer. Got it. Okay. I'll take a seat here. It looks like our award-winning water director would like to make a comment. Good afternoon, Ms. Menard. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I just wanted to mention that, um, that uh, Lee got it correct about water having system development charges. Wastewater also has system development charges. And uh, he is correct that we have had a practice of uh, those, those charges particularly being requested to be waived or deferred by some affordable housing projects in the past. The uh, 100 Water Street project, for example, and one or two more that Bonnie probably recognizes um, and would kind of expect for more of that to be coming, I think. So that is, a, that is an issue for us to wrestle with. Thank you. I, I appreciate you bringing this forward. I think this is really important. And I think as we move in the direction of more subsidized affordable housing, we want to think about what that means for our infrastructure in, in many forms. Um, so having us analyze what could be applied here that makes sense for our community, I think it's a great direction to go in. My only other question is, does that require an additional nexus study or anything like that? Or would it simply just be staff uh, time and analysis? Thanks for that question. Um, at this point, we've got the Nexus study that establishes the rates um, as they are right now. Um, one thing that I will point out since you asked the question about additional Nexus studies is, um, as Chief Odie uh, referenced, costs have gone up substantially. And we, uh, we did that Nexus study, even though it's only a few years old now, um, there, there's been very high inflation. Sure. So um, we could, at some point in time, um, revisit that and we would likely end up at uh, 
a higher per square foot rate across the board, right? Um, because you know the fire apparatus that was eighty thousand. Uh, that was 800,000 at one point more, is, more now, <laughs> is now a million. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that context. I think that's really important information and we should be aware of that. And I also think that this should inform the state in terms of some of the impacts local communities are experiencing associated with increased demand for housing production. And so however we can translate that to our state representatives and lobbyists at that level to advocate on behalf of our cities and getting supports for these types of things, I think is another avenue for uh, us to pursue at some point. But anyways, um, that's all my questions. So thank you. Thank you, council member. The vice mayor is recognized. I have just one question. I'm I, the child care impact fees. Can someone um, let me know where do those go in the city? Thanks for that question. So, the um, most recent direction that we have is for those child care impact fees to go towards the child care facility that we have in the affordable housing library project, and um, the way that we were initially planning to um, spend the first batch of funds was to do a child care needs assessment. And then based on that child care needs assessment, we would then institute a program whereby we um, uh, provide, those, provide that funding to um, facilitate either the expansion of existing facilities or the rehabilitation or the continuation of existing uh, child care facilities or, or the production of new child care facilities. We'd be depending on the uh, findings in that needs assessment to help us understand where and what types and how we expand child care resources in the city. That is now um, sort of the, the second step. So after we move forward with the dedication of funds just to the child care portion in the library project, then we would move on to saving up those funds again to go towards that needs assessment. We'd then be bringing it back to the council for you to see that needs assessment and provide direction in terms of how we would uh, dole that money out. The county does have a program related to this, and so we could leverage the county's program in terms of the, the process, but that would be um, something that we would present to the council uh, to, uh, after we uh, bring the child care needs assessment forward. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you. Ms. Gontar Johnson, I think you had an initial question. Sorry, no. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to confirm um, two things. I want to confirm that the child care impact fee doesn't have that five-year um, time limit that the public health, public safety, excuse me, public safety one does? It does it have that five-year limit. Yes, I believe all impact fees do. There is an opportunity to make specified findings that allow for an extension of that five years, is my understanding. Um, and those have to be done in advance of the five-year uh, timeline of the um, mm -hmm. collection of those fees. Okay. Is that is, is yeah, that your so understanding as well, Tony? Yes. Great. Thanks. So the, I, I'm going to assume that we're tracking that closely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that I will assume, but I want to just say explicitly, is as part of our exploration that we will be reaching out and talking to um, affordable housing organizations and um, groups and advocates and developers just want to say that uh, absolutely specifically. assuming yeah. we we find that there is a, a general desire on behalf of the council then yes we would be doing that outreach we'd be coordinating with our economic development team and talking with affordable housing developers to understand implications and explore the options you know full charges partial charges are there certain exemptions in some instances versus others and so forth thank you that's it any questions comments Okay, uh, so a couple of questions, Mr. Butler. Uh, we're talking, am I right, we're talking right now about that percentage of housing that's going to be constructed that is affordable, and currently we provide, am I right on this, they are exempt in 100% projects. There's an exemption from these two particular fees, is that correct? That's correct, public safety and child care. 
Say it again. Public safety fees and child care. So, so public safety encompasses the fire and yes, police, police and, and, and the, the child care. Okay, so those two fees, if you're building 100% affordable, you're exempt under a current, current ordinance. So the question, if I understand it before us, is do we want to change that? Do we want to say that 100% affordable projects pay something towards that? And what is that something? And, and so on. And if we give you that direction, you'll go out, there'll be a lot of answers to that, and back you come. And then right. the council gets some choices. Correct. So, uh, and, and if I'm looking out over the planning horizon for the next eight years, uh, roughly 80% of what's going to be constructed will be market rate. Uh, I suspect, or some substantial portion is going to be in, well, let me, let me start this again. We are planning for roughly 4,000 housing units to be built over the next eight years. Some of those will be in projects that are 100% affordable, but not very many is my guess. 100% affordable housing is really hard to build, right? It is, although we, we end up getting decent chunks. Uh, you know, we've got... Yeah. 124 units in one yep. project, 80 yep. in another, 65 in another, and so they, those do add up over do time. Do add up, admittedly, yeah, they do. My issue here is that we are going to get a substantial amount of, there's going to be three quarters of a billion dollars in investment in Santa Cruz in the next eight years around housing, generally. And because of that, we are going to get a lot of revenue in on the child care impact fee and the public safety impact fee. From those that are currently covered, nobody's talking here about changing any of that. It's it's about the 100% affordable, is that correct? That's and correct. And we are gonna get the impact fee on all the others, on everything else. Correct. Well, so I will tell you, I'm deeply skeptical about adding one more penny of cost to affordable housing projects, one more penny to any unit, because every time we do it, we've done it twice today. We, we've heard it twice today. If you take this stuff in isolation, none of it's a terrible impact fee. It's gonna break the bank on putting together an affordable housing project. But if you add what we just did on, on uh, electricity, now you add in, you say, well, we're gonna start thinking about putting these people in some way, shape, or form these kind of housing units are supposed to be affordable. And then we separately maybe have two other items in the next couple of months and then three more after that. And not a, one of them individually is gonna make it impossible to do affordable housing, but it is going to, each one of them is going to incrementally increase the cost of building affordable housing. And so I'll tell you one person here that I'm gonna get outvoted on this, but, but, but I, I get it that you're gonna go out and you're gonna study this. I am deeply skeptical and reluctant to add one more penny of the cost of building affordable housing anywhere in the city of Santa Cruz. So uh, as it, at least it comes to my vote, which you probably aren't gonna need on this motion, but when the actual substance comes back here, I hope that there's a recognition that this absolutely makes affordable housing less affordable. It, it, it's axiomatically true. And so I, before the council goes to, uh, forward on this, it's the conversation today is not about whether or not we're gonna have enough money for child care and public safety, because the general fund takes care of your, and, and that's, our, that's a decision we have to make at budget time, whether it's capital outlay or operations expenses. And so to find a fund for you, I have no trouble with that, we have one. It's on the market rate housing that's built. I get that, and that makes sense, and I won't vote to change that, to make it less so for you. On the affordable housing issue as it relates to child care impact fee uh, uh, and on the public safety side, I don't wanna do that. Uh, I don't think there's a compelling argument yet that somehow we're not able to do what we need in public safety or over in uh, child care uh, uh, other than going to the 100% affordable and saying, we're gonna get more of this from you. Um, I, I don't think that, to me, it's not a compelling argument yet that somehow we're not gonna have what we need unless we go over here and start charging some form of impact fee to 100% affordable projects. 
So I'm not asking for a response. I'm sharing with you what my thought is uh, on this. Uh, matter of spec for the council. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, is there anyone who wishes to comment on this? Okay, matter of spec for the council. I'll move the um, I'll move the recommendation to accept the report and then also to um, have staff explore as outlined in the recommendation of the of the agenda report. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion and a second by the vice mayor. Debate or discussion on this matter. Ms. Brown. Well, I um, I wasn't going to say anything because I, I think we're pretty ready to. Um, move through this item, but I, I did want to comment, uh, Mayor, on the in response to the comments you made because I think they're, you know, very important ones. The you know, in my mind, what what I see here is um, if we do make changes um, as Director Butler suggested, and I'm sure um, Director Lipscomb is also thinking about, uh, we may just end up moving the where the subsidy comes from or the, the support comes from. And if that's what the council decides they want to do, um, you know, I don't have strong feelings one way or another about that. But I do think that your point about the decision we're making uh, will cost affordable housing developers more, I mean, it, it will cost money and it's got to come from somewhere. And it's unlikely to make a project, you know, not viable the, given the amounts, but it will mean that they're going to come to us for the affordable housing trust fund uh, to subsidize it. So just be thinking about that um, as we proceed, uh, hopefully with caution. For the comment, Madam Vice Mayor. I would like to say the same could be said for our last item. And from my perspective, I think this is more important um, because it pertains to the citizens that are living here and will be living, you know, here for moving into the, the new developments where the idea of um, greenhouse gas emissions, there's other things that could be done, right? So um, I think this is very important and should absolutely, we should consider it. For the debate or discussion, seeing hearing none. Uh, Thank you. If I could just get clarification, is this applying to both the public safety impact fee and the child care impact fee? Correct. Thank you. The staff recommendation neglected to include the child care impact fee, so I wanted to make sure. Oh, I, I thought that was the case. Thank you for that clarification. I didn't realize it wasn't included in the recommendation. Yes, for both, please. Great. Thank you. We had inadvertently left that out when we changed the report. I want to make Ms. Ms. sure Ms. Bush is clear on the motion. No, we don't know what the difference is. Okay, Mr. Butler, come back here. Let's make sure we know what the motion is. The uh, second part, aside from accepting the report, is to provide, uh, so recommend that the, or direct the staff to um, look at the potential applicability of the public safety impact fee and child care impact fee to 100% affordable housing projects. Exactly. Thank you for that. Thank you. Pause for one sec. Uh, uh, Mr. Newsom, please proceed. I was. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I was just going to quickly say I'm, I'm inclined to, very cautiously uh, support um, uh, the action as it is, but I will associate myself with. Uh, Mayor Keeley's comment to an extent of I am very skeptical that any options will not increase affordable housing and I'm not, uh, or the, the construction will increase the cost of constructing affordable housing and I, uh, as myself, am not interested in any options that will increase the cost of constructing affordable housing or will become an impediment of uh, constructing affordable housing. So. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Bush, or what? <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 I don't have anything to say. No, I'm thinking through <laughs> Why should you change now? I know. It's I hard. see. It's a, it's a Ms. Problem. Bush, do you have the motion? <laughs> we have the motion directly. Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. No. Motion passes and so ordered. Item 19 has been continued to a future date. Mr. City Attorney, do we have further business come before us? We do not. Ms. Bush, further business come before us. A motion to adjourn is in order, and the Vice Mayor reluctantly makes such a motion, <laughs> and Mr. Newsom seconds it equally as reluctantly. Clerk will call the roll. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>
Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Adjourn. Can we say it's not debatable? I know. I know. I, I, I